we go. Hi all, it's Andrew and it's Monday and it's Bob Clear Mountain for part two. Hi, Bob. Hey, Andrew. How are you? Nice to see you, man. You too. Good to see you. And got to see you earlier this week and not as uh, as happy circumstances, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, one of the Al, Al one of the many, many Schmidt. deserved tributes to uh, to Mr. Al Schmidt. Al Schmidt. Yeah. Um, but we're back for part two. We managed to make it almost out of the 80s last time. But first, we got three things to clear up really quickly. So the consoles at Electric Lady were data mix. Right. So That's there you go, was, which yeah. Eddie Kramer yeah. apparently had a big hand in having seen them at uh, at Record Plant. Ah, uh, right. Uh, Michael Shreve was a drummer for Santana. I like my brain went into total meltdown mode oh, yeah. when it turned out you hadn't even worked on the record. Like, OK, that was it. And the drummer, speaking of drummers on the Maynard Ferguson record, was Peter Erskine. Peter Erskine, of course. OK. We both could have blanked out on this name. I don't know. Well, it, it happens all the time on these. And s there are weeks when I know everything. And most weeks I have absolutely, I know I'm going to say the wrong person. So I just don't yeah. say anybody. But now we're completely <laughs> caught up to date. Right. So there you go. But I'd like to, if we could, jump in. We'd actually made it up to around 1990. But we want to go back to 1988 because that was, I believe, the first Crowded House record you worked on. All right. Okay. And we should talk about some Crowded House because those are some great, great records. And we were just talking about you going over there to mix a, one of them. And right. so we don't even have to talk about a particular record, but just, just working with those guys and and like that. Did we talk about them at all? Last I don't think we did. Um, I, I went back through and I think I, I put it off <clears throat> because we were coming towards the end. So we we finished up talking about um, the Laurie Anderson and In Excess right. and Robbie Robertson and stuff. But I'm pretty sure we didn't. And even if we did, you can repeat yourself. All right. Well, I just want to talk about the uh, my introduction to them. First off, I mean, before I ever heard of Crowded House... I used to go to sleep in my apartment in, in New York with MTV on, which is the, the thing at the time that we all, for some reason, paid attention to. <laughs> and, it, and um, you know, so I'm drifting off to sleep and, you know, you listen to all the crap that was you know, 80s music. <laughs> it was terrible, most of it. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, what's that? What's that sound? And I look up, who is that? I'm, and this sounds amazing, whatever this is. This music is so much better than anything else. And it was Crowded House. It was Don't Dream It's Over. Right. It was a great video with, you know, walking through doors. And it was just a wacky, wacky video. And so, who the, and so immediately I went out and bought the album. Right. And it became my favorite. I became like a little kid. You know, I, I felt like back when I used to dream about the Beatles, you know, right. And I was like a big fan. All of a sudden I was, I was a, here I was in the, you know, fairly big time mixer, I guess you could say. I would but all of a sudden I be say so. became this, this fan of this band, you know, this band from New Zealand. And, uh, and, and then I realized, then I did some research. And I realized, Oh, I see. It's, it's uh, Neil Finn who was in, um, uh, split ends and everything like that. So, ah, okay. And uh, he he also wrote um, "I Got You" and and "Message to My Girl" and all these great songs for them. Oh, this is starting to make sense. Well, you know. And then they 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 booked the Beacon Theater, which is right down the street from where I lived. I lived on Seventy Fifth Street at the time. And uh, so I told my girlfriend at the time, Mary, I I, I said, look, you got to go. Tickets are going on sale tomorrow. You got to go down and make sure we get tickets to the show. You know, I was so excited to see this these guys, and then the day before they were they were playing, their tour manager calls me up and says, "says this Bob Clement? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Crowded House is playing at the Beacon Theater tomorrow night, and Neil would really like it if you would come down and see them because he's really thinking about he wants to talk to you." I was like, "What?" <laughs> you know nice you know and that, that's so weird because i just thought i don't know you know i was just this fan and now the the leader of the band called me wow <laughs> but anyway so then i went to see them and then then he said yeah i'd love you to, to mix an album for us that's oh, awesome and, that, and then it went on from there and then we mixed um temple of low men 
with Mitchell Froom and everybody, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, that's awesome. I mean, to and to be able to do it so quickly from fanboy to, yeah, I'll mix your record, you know, that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> sure, I'll mix your record. That's pretty I mean, but, did uh, you say, oh, I've already got tickets, you know? I, yeah, I did. I told him, I said, well, you don't have to. I got tickets already. <laughs> yeah. Can, you know, I'm going to be there. <laughs> you, won't, you can't keep me away. That is awesome. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that was great. And now the other interesting story about it is that on Temple of Low Men, which is just one of my favorite records I've ever mixed. You know, I love that album. Um, I had just come back from Montserrat, mixing an album down there for a guy named Midjur, um, who was from a band called, um, I forgot the name of this band. Oh, <laughs> and it was right really on the tip famous, of my really, brain. But Really famous band. It? Yes. <laughs> Yes, but Mitch, you're a great guy, and um, but and this had happened to a bunch of engineers that came out of that place that swam in their pool that ended up with swimmer's ear. There's something in that in their swimming pool that was bad, <laughs> and uh, especially if you're really drunk, <laughs> it would happen a lot there. Right, <laughs> but anyway, so I had this terrible ear infection that I didn't know anything about nobody told me that oh if you have an ear infection make sure you don't ever get water in there oh, so right. i'm trying to clean it out you know in the shower so i just kept making it worse it got really painful to the point where i couldn't hear out of one ear i mixed that entire album with one ear wow <laughs> and i didn't tell them you didn't tell them no <laughs> you just made everybody sit on your left <laughs> yeah <laughs> right and uh you know, and I, I would, I actually wired one of the monitor inputs on the console reverse. So I, I just kept switching back and forth, left and right. You know? Wow. And did, I mean, did yeah. you work in, in mono or you just let both speakers go and you just flopped them? I just flopped them back and forth quite a bit, a lot. You know? Right. <laughs> I, you know, it's like Brian Wilson or uh, Pete Thomas, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Not, not Pete. Is that, a, no, not. Am I thinking of? You're not not Chris Thomas. Chris Thomas. That's what I'm thinking of. Chris Thomas. No, Pete Thomas is the is the drummer. Is yeah, the drummer for Elvis Costello. Elvis Costello. But yeah, he's so, also a good friend. So Chris is is definitely one here. Yeah, he's. Oh, I had no here. idea. Yeah, and he's made some of the best rock records. On the absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Know? Some of the most diverse and incredible records made. Yeah, yeah. and then Brian Wilson, who was definitely one here, and yeah, he's all so right. We know it. Yeah, right. <laughs> he wrote a couple of good songs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you know, writing, uh, like mixing in particular, with with one ear, w would seem slightly problematic. But it's, you know, it's hard. It's difficult. It's really difficult. One or two songs I might have done done slightly differently if I had to. Right. Ears. I mean, when you listen back to it, do you hear artifacts of that though, or just like uh, stuff you would have changed? A couple of songs, yeah. I go, oh, you know, it's a little right heavy or something or right. whatever, you know. <laughs> That's but funny. it's still it's still a beautiful record, and I, I'm I'm happy with what generally what I did on it. Yeah, and I think it's this came up a lot. We did a, a panel about hearing health a couple months ago now, and it's. Obviously, your ears are super important because it's how you hear this stuff. But none of the decision making is based on the frequency response to the half a dB of the thing. Absolutely. It's bigger picture than that. It's all cognitive stuff. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, people always say, oh, you must have great hearing. And I said, no, my hearing isn't any better than anybody else's. That's for sure. I mean, I know that. In fact, the, the analog guy, Lucas Vandermeer at Apogee, has much better hearing than I do, I, I'm, I'm, I know. But, uh, but it is just what you said. It's, it's about how your brain works and, and your taste and how you perceive music and how you, you know what I mean? It's not about precise hearing. It, it really isn't. No, no, no. I mean, and obviously... I something egregious could be a problem but uh, yeah 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 and not only that but you you know you tend to lose high frequencies as you get older but i don't really notice that i mean i'm a bit older now you know but it's it's all relative you you hear the world as the way you're hearing it and then you mix something and you use what you you can hear. I, I just don't notice any difference. And I've had hearing tests, and I know my top end's down a bit on the top, top end. Of course it is. Yeah. 
it's, it doesn't ma- doesn't make any difference. It's all kind of relative. And it's interesting on the on the thing that we did for uh, Al Schmidt the other day. Um, Jack Puig said an interesting thing about mixing that it's all about balance, and that's just in your brain. That's really nothing to do with how good your hearing your actual hearing is. Yeah, it's really it's how you. It's just a brain thing. How you know how to balance where what should be where and what what should be louder and what should be softer you know what i mean yeah yeah and using contrasts and balance to your advantage i mean you're the the king of that having things really pop out and be loud because they should be you know yeah yeah so the yeah the perfect hearing thing it's not a thing no it's not a thing (laughs) (laughs) um all right around that same time you mixed a michael penn record Ah, yeah. Yeah, no myth. And obviously, fantastic artist, great songwriter. And also, um, and I, I should have, I meant to actually have a, a look back. Was this one of the earlier things you did with Tony Berg? Um, well, the first thing I did with Tony Berg was um, the second Charlie Sexton album, which was oh, right. co-produced. And um, MCA put us together. I didn't know Tony. Tony didn't know me. And you know, it's one of the only good things. <laughs> yeah, right. I shouldn't say that, but they didn't do a lot of good things. <laughs> like they left his name off the front of the CD. That that was kind of a bad thing. <laughs> but um, Charlie's name, that is. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> no, it left it. It's, it's on the vinyl and on the cassette, but not on the CD. They just, oh, did we need his name on that too? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But anyway uh yeah so we co-produced that together and we hit it off immediately. we became best friends immediately you know and uh and then you know he would he kind of went on to produce all kinds of people and so yeah that was one of the things that he asked me to mix and it was it was really good good and i that it was funny because i didn't think i loved the song no myth and I, but i didn't think it could be a hit you know because some of the lyrics, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's some pretty obscure. Well, I mean, if if you were a good reader, there were things in there that you would know, but the general public wouldn't. Right. And uh, and it was very very interesting melodically, and you know, I thought it would be, be just over people's heads. I really did, you know, but it was actually did, did really well. I was so glad to, that it did. Well, you're one of the few people who must actually listen to lyrics then yeah because for me it's it's tone poetry unless there's something bad in there you yeah. know the lyrics don't don't pop out because it's i mean yeah he wrote james joyce's ulysses as a song basically where you know you need a handbook to get through it but it doesn't yeah. matter it's the the this, as you say it's so interesting melodically and harmonically yeah what's going on it really was and tony, tony always adds oh why, why don't you do this chord instead in the bridge or you know what i mean he'll he'll come up with some inversion or some interesting um transition of some sort that oh well that's that's pretty cool that'll just wake you up you know and, right uh, tony's tony's amazing he's a brilliant musician you know an arranger yeah yeah and one of the few decent a and r folk yeah when he was doing as well that, you know yeah, yeah. I know, and now he's actually managing mixers. I think is he? <laughs> yeah, I think he manages uh, somebody who used to work for me. Is he managing Sean me. Everett? Uh, he might be. I, might be. I don't know. Well, yeah, I have to ask him. Maybe he's, maybe he gave up on the management thing, but I know he was for a little while. Wow, he's, he's got producers. he's got too much energy. That guy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know it pisses me Slow off. down and leave some <laughs> leave something for the rest of us. Yeah, really. So, um, all right. So, same year as the Michael Penn record is Tears for Fears. All right. Which okay. I love the story. You want to tell the story about how that that whole process started for you <laughs> on that record? Okay. Well, the <laughs> the first song that they gave me to mix was "Sowing the Seeds," right? Which is an amazing piece of music. Yeah. And it was uh, very complicated. It was on two um, of those Mitsubishi. Oh, the 32 track tracks. Machines. Yeah. Yeah. So 64 tracks. 
back then that was a lot you know nowadays 64 tracks was the big deal <laughs> but um but they had you know it was so complicated they'd stack the tracks so there would like there would be three different things on each track and so just tr trying to get it to in its point where i could bring it up on the desk and mix it it was challenging so i spent a whole day on the thing i spent more than a day on like sorting it out and then doing a mix and uh roland orzabal comes in to listen to what i had and he kind of shakes his head he goes you know there's really nothing in that mix that makes any sense to me at all <laughs> <laughs> you know and i like right i just want to like shrink down and crawl under the door you know and go, man like, wow oh okay because yeah no that's not you don't have that at all and i go okay well you want to clue me in as to what you're looking for because okay so he gave me some some ideas and um so i worked on it for another couple hours and uh, he comes back and he goes nah no you don't have it <laughs> I go, okay well what do you want to do he goes um I thought, you know, I thought, well, I'm just fired. You know, he's right. going to walk out of here. And he goes, nah, let's try a different song. <laughs> okay. And so then we put up Year of the Knife, which is another song in that album. And uh, he was real happy with that. And then he just, I think the producer ended up, who was also a good mixer, yeah, um, did a little section at the end. It was like a hybrid mix between my mix and then it cut into another little bit of his mix. But so that that went really well. And then he said, okay, well, that was good. Well, let's try this other song, this woman in chains. Okay. And um that went really well. And he was real happy with that. That was complex too. He he actually had um oh, what's his name from Genesis? Uh Phil Collins. Phil Collins by drums on it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um uh, and um but the thing is, he had chopped up, like he didn't actually, what he played wasn't really, he, he just had sections of what he played. And then the fills, he would take parts of each fill. He must have had him go play a bunch of, whole bunch of fills. And then he took bits of them and chopped them together. And it was on all these different tracks, different parts of the fills on different tracks, I remember. It was really this weirdest, the oddest, arrangement of drums i mean nowadays in pro tools that would probably be a normal thing but on tape it was but it would have been chopped on multi-track were these all like mono and stereo mixes like, of the kit or yeah like stereo fills that kind of thing you know? right like right. basically there was a snare bass and snare drum snare and bass drum and overheads but then he had these fills on little bits of of whatever little sections and but it just sounded totally natural. I don't know how he did it, but it sounded amazing. I mean, it was really, re really good. Man, and you that's know, a I, that's a fantastic mix. Woman yeah, Chains. thanks. Yeah, I've had a lot of comments. I should go back and listen. I haven't heard that since I did it. It's <laughs> really it's just tons of comments on it. It's just huge. But I'm wondering after sowing the seeds and then working through the second song, were you adjusting what you were doing to what you sort of realized he wanted to hear or just you were always just doing what you hear? I mean, obviously you're, you're molding yourself to the, to the project a little bit. I probably, yeah, I think I did. I don't, I don't know, but you, I probably did. Cause, Cause I, I mean, woman in chains is, is not dry at all. And I've heard you in other interviews talking about like your mix of sowing the seeds you started off you went after the it's pretty obviously beatly like yeah, almost to a I copyright thought. issue point in spots <laughs> so you would go for that for that. naturally that's right real you know? dry kind of i did i mix it really dry and he really if you listen to it it's pretty yeah it's not overly re reverby but it's, there's a lot of effects and a lot of space on that and i think it's probably to his credit, it's the reason he gets away with being so beatly because it does go sonically elsewhere. And it's it's yeah. more of like a little dream homage instead of like, hey, we look, we did a Beatles track. You know. I know, and I should have realized that. I didn't I didn't get that. Well I mean if he'd said, you know. <laughs> but it's interesting because I you know, I worked a day on that that song and then the producer um uh 
God, I don't remember his name, but uh, he was a really good producer. Is that is that Dave Bascom, um, or am I confusing that? A them? week. No. I'm What's con- that? It's not Dave Bascom. I'm confusing it with Dave something. Bascom. That's it was right. Dave. Dave okay. Bascom. Yeah, that's right. And um, great guy. You know, was really helpful to me actually. Um, but they, I mixed an entire album in the time it took them to mix that single. Right. Because <laughs> I, I, cause I went over to. Uh, the CBS studio there and mixed, uh, this is in London and mixed, um, what was it? Uh, uh, a band, band called Deacon Blue. I mixed their entire album and they were, just, and by the time I finished that, they were just finishing up. So in the seeds apparently. Well, there you go. I yeah. mean, yeah. It, so it's, I didn't feel so bad. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, if you think about it, 64 tracks with three things on each track, I mean, you needed a hundred and something input console, which didn't exist. No, no. It's not like you could just molt some stuff and do some mute automation. You had to really figure things out. It was tricky. Yeah, it was really tricky to fi- to figure it out. And um, and not only that, but the song goes on and on. It's all these different sections in the song itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the whole thing changes perspective as as it goes. It's a really complicated piece of music. You know, did you amazing piece of music i think i think so too did did you yeah. ever mix in sections like ever when you had a song that needed scene changes and things like that and then cut the stuff together or did you always manage to have it all happen start to finish in the analog day yeah before uh, not you know, i should say analog days, like but pre-automation before automa- and... pre-automation sure that's the way we did everything right pretty much you know but not since uh, automation i always figure out a way to automate it so it plays all the way through right you know just you know, i can print it you know I'll, I'll change channels like i'll put things on different different channels or different subgroups or something like that you know but it, it'll and i have a 72 input desk so right i can usually deal with it right but for the sowing the seeds where were you mixing that um that was on an ssl it, it was at olympic right and uh, at the time when Olympic was still there, and it was a, um, it was a G series with GEQ too, which I hated. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there was the, the GEQ was more popular in, in England, I think, than it was here. Yeah. And um, and so that was another thing for me that I just can't get this EQ to sound right to me. <laughs> so. But anyway, <laughs> right. Excellent. A great studio, though. I loved working there. It was yeah. such a fantastic place. Yep, and long gone now. <laughs> in the in barns, it was just sort of outside of town there, and the other yeah, side of the river. Yeah, heading out towards Richmond, and yeah, yeah. beautiful. Um. So, all right, we're in the we're in the nineties. We've made it to the nineties which is very yeah. exciting. So in 91, another record that Tony Berg produced that I absolutely love is the Squeeze record, Play, uh, yeah. that you mixed. Fantastic record. I mean, Thank I don't know you. if there's anything specific to say about that, or but it's it's just great. Well, it was the first thing I mixed at, at um, Real World at Peter Gabriel's studio. Right. Which I loved. Uh, I thought it was great. And working with Tony again, which was great. And I love. I've always been a squeeze fan you know ever since rg bargy from the, from the, their first few records and uh, so it was just a treat for me to work with them and they're just great guys as well and and then working at real world was i, I don't know it's, i don't know how many of the viewers have ever had a chance to be there or know anything about it but it's in this farmhouse house out near bath in this little town called box and um have you been there yeah, yeah, I have a yeah. couple of times. But that room, that mix room, it's enormous. It's this giant room, and you're, the, it's got this big window in front of you, and you're kind of sitting facing a duck pond, and you see the ducks and the, uh, and the mallards, and you know, <laughs> while you're mixing, and I remember just thinking, wow, this this working here makes me feel really important because it's so big. <laughs> This big wrap around SSL and you know it was it was great. Then the food there is amazing and yeah. But, uh, but that was I loved that record, you know. Especially there's a couple of songs called uh, a song called The Truth and another song called um, uh, uh, Satisfied 
I mean, just and not, not that many people know that record, even really. I don't know if a lot of Squeeze fans. Yeah, it wasn't one of their more popular records, but uh, I just love it. I mean, I, I just really enjoyed that one a lot. And then I mixed another one, the next one for them as well, that that Tony and somebody else produced. It. Right. It's it, the play album was was the best one. I yeah. think it's great, and it really is a great. It was the right record for Tony to produce too, like because musically oh, yeah. Tony goes for the Beatly things a lot, and it worked perfectly on that record. Yeah, so really, yeah, it really did, really amazing. Tony uh, did a great job. And then I saw them on that tour. Actually, they opened for Sting, and they played the oh, Hollywood yeah. Bowl, uh, which was a pretty great show. Yeah, I missed that. <laughs> so anyway, enough about. They were just what a band. I mean, yeah. Them live were amazing. I mean, Glenn uh, Glenn Tilbrook is an incredible guitar player, and he's singing and playing this incredible stuff. I mean, so talented. I mean, well, beyond talented. So now you're an East Coast guy. So did you know the Uncle Floyd show? Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. Of course. Did you ever see Squeeze on the Uncle Floyd show? No. Oh my God. Okay. So for people who don't know, Uncle Floyd, it was a, like a, it started off as a very local public access show and then it spread to the tri-state area. So it was in New York, New Jersey and Connecticut. And he would play stride piano and he had all these puppets and he was, it was just really goofy and stupid, but he had amazing musical guests who were incredibly obviously lip syncing. Like yeah. he would just play the record and they would yeah. have some instruments. And Squeeze <laughs> went on and it was when Pulling Muscles from a Shell was gigantic. Big, yeah. And they were on there playing that. And it was just the two of them. And during the guitar solo, we picked up a trombone just because it was so <laughs> obviously not them playing. Yeah, wrong. Yeah, and it's right. still one of my favorite moments of, uh, of the Uncle Floyd show. Oh, I wonder if that's if you get that. On no, something. I will tell you. I, we can do I a deep dive on that. the Uncle Floyd show. I own. There's a guy. I can't remember which one. It's one of the guys who is on the show. Um, yeah. You all right? Just let me. Hang yeah, on. yeah. It's probably. probably it's Uncle Floyd calling. Yeah. This is when I, I got to do show and okay. tell. So I brought a, a tape measure for you guys. Oh, right. We're 10 foot. Today? Three meter. Ah, geez. It's We're good. We're going to need to move it. I'm in the middle of another of an interview with somebody else at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. So my Allen key it, that I was using. Can you call me back in a couple hours? And like three, two, so it's for putting together uh, brackets for my Atmos yeah. speakers, which... I'm going to have the missing pieces to those soon. Uh, Sorry, man. It's it's apparently another interview I was supposed to be doing right now. Oh, no. I double booked myself. Do you have to go or are you No, no, no. That's that's for the Cahoots album. All right. uh, I mean, you can do it as part of this interview if you want. No, I'll do it. (laughs) Yeah, I'll do it later. It's it's just for liner notes or something. All right. Well, look, just to finish up the Uncle Floyd thing real quick. Yeah. One of the guys, and I can't remember who it is, one of the guys who was like another person on the show, for some reason owns all the rights to all the video and has put out multiple DVDs. And I have a lot of them, and some of them are fantastic. A lot of it's not really that watchable. (laughs) But because of copyright stuff, all the musical guests are taken out. So. Yeah, well, that's too no bad. musical guests at all. But there is the fantastic uh, skit where I can't remember what the guy's name is. He's running like a used car lot. And, you know, they had a dog that would just wander around on the set. Yeah, right. And yeah. he was um, he's something, the wonder dog. I can't remember what they call him. But anyway, he just wandered on the set and took a crap like right in the middle of them doing this thing. He said, oh, <laughs> right. it looks like he put down a deposit on that car. <laughs> right. So anyway. Uncle Floyd. It was yeah, on, true. if I remember rightly, it was on in between Saturday Night Live and the <clears throat> Benny Hill show. Right. <laughs> like really late. And right before Don Kirshner's rock concert sometimes, too. Right. That's right. God. All really right. Anyway. Remember that. Yeah. Anyway, 1980s East Coast. So let's move on, shall we, to 1992, where you worked with the Beatle, Mr. Ringo Starr. 
Right. I didn't actually work with him. It was oh. a thing that Don, Don was produced. Okay. And um, I remember I was in Bearsville and yeah, he just sent it to me or something. I, I can't remember, but I mixed it. Yeah, I just mixed it on my own, I think, or maybe with Don. I right. Can't remember. But I never, I still haven't met Ringo. Really? <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there's not much to that story. No, no, that's all right. But he you did send me a fax, I remember, and said thanks. <laughs> Back in the days of faxes. Nice. So a handwritten thanks. <laughs> handwritten fax. That's yeah. nice. So you were mixing all over the place, and we're about to get to where you finally built your own studio. But did you have like a short list of studios you would mix at, or were you pretty open as long as it was an SSL? Or did it not even have to be an SSL? <clears throat> Had to be an SSL. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know that's my one. No, I mean, not unfortunately. I mean, now it's it's very bizarre for anyone not to have their own mix room. So the idea that you right. could just go anywhere in the world and show up, pair of NS10s on an SSL and start mixing is yeah. uh it's amazing well it was great back then because there were i know there were so many of them and you could and you could take a mix from one to another i mean there were a, let's see and roxy music was it that or no it might have been boys and girls i can't remember and brian adams i both both of those things i mixed you know I'd do some mixes at power station i'd go to electric lady i'd go to to air in london you know, like those, like those three studios kind of, I was kind of going in between. And then sometimes here in LA, um, A&M, which is now Henson. And um, so, yeah, I was like, as long as there was an SSL. Right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd, I'd be there. And would you pick uh, sort of based on the artist where they were? Or was it just like, man, I really feel like being in London now? Oh no! It was where the artist was. Yeah. Was yeah. I usually didn't. Wasn't up to me. Right. So they'd they say never they'd pick a city and you'd give them a list of studios. Yeah, or I would just book one. You know, I'd, I'd book Air or wherever. Right. You know, or there was another. What was it? Ad Vision. I used to like too because they had an SSL, a couple of SSLs. Right. You know. Um, yeah, and then out here there was Record Plant and A and M. And then there was a place up in the valley. Uh, I forgot what it was called. It had one. You know, it was, a, it was nice because there were. And then then everybody started getting rid of them and getting J series, and well, so much for that idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, which or did Neves. which did bring you up to to buying your own? But we got a, a couple records to get through before we get to that, because you. I don't know how much of this record, because there are 5 million people who worked on this record, but that Tom Jones record, uh, The Lead and How to Swing It, which was like his total rebirth album. And I'm curious what you worked on on that record, because there are a ton of different producers and mixers, and if there's anything in particular about that one. I don't know. Um, yeah, I saw that in my in my uh, discography. I was just working on a new discography, and... I, I really hardly remember that. Yeah, I'd imagine you know, it was only, like one song then or I something. I must have just mixed one song for somebody that was producing it. Uh, that I don't know. I mean, the thing I remember from Tom Jones is a few years ago, ago he played at one of the KCRW radio shows over at Apogee. And so that's it's funny because that's the thing that stands out to me. The, this mix that I did, I, I don't actually... Right. I hate to say it, but I don't remember. It's, Unfortunately, and I love Tom Jones. I mean, I'm, you know, it's silly. It's just well, like the Ramones. You know, I recorded part of one of the Ramones albums. Yeah. And I didn't remember that. Yeah. Doing it, you know, it's, it's terrible, <laughs> <in> my memory. <laughs> it's it's fine. I, it, and Tom last week, I believe, became the oldest person to have a number one record in the UK. Really? With his new record. Yeah. Great. Is that a number one? A yeah. Number one? Excellent. Yeah. He's so good, man. That guy is so talented. Yeah. What a voice. But know? that record was a real turning point. He'd, he'd gone to the point where I think people were expecting him to like only do shows in Vegas. You know, it yeah. was starting to turn into like, oh, it's just a time to do a Tom Jones review. And he remade himself completely on that record and just exploded again. Wow. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. I have to go back and get it. So it. You, it's a good thing <laughs> Sorry, you were a I part of it. <laughs> I can't tell you much about, it. but do I do? I do remember mixing the one song, whatever it was. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, this is the part where I'm just going to say names, but I've I've pulled out a couple of things which seemed a little a little odd as well. So, well, first of all, there's um, a live Bonnie Raitt record that Don was put together. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's an Adam Ant record. Oh yeah, right. I'd love to hear a little bit about that because that was an attempt at a rebirth, basically. Because yeah. I think it had been at least eight years or so since he put anything Long out. Time, yeah, yeah. Um, that was another one where he he just sent it to me. He called me up on the phone and I said, "Yeah, great," and sent it to me. Never met him. I did talk to him though. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm sure I did. And uh, you know, I don't remember anything specifically about it except like I I enjoyed it and I I always liked Adam Man. I yeah, he, he was an interesting character and I liked it because he had this big hit back in the '80s at some point. Yeah, and music. And, uh, yeah. Right. Ant music. That's right. Yeah. It's cool. Fun record. And this was pretty good. And I, and I thought he was going to, oh man, he's going to come back and it never quite happened, unfortunately. Right. So did you find at this time, sort of early to mid nineties that you started not spending time in the room with the artists as much as you used to? Cause it feels as uh, though there are more records that are like, yep, yeah, I mixed it. They were done. Like that was it. Uh, yeah, I gradually got that way, you know. Um, probably one of the first ones like that was was still in the A's was um, for the Cure. Uh, was a uh, okay, once again, what's the name of that song? Um, I just like it. heaven. Yeah, it's called Just Like Heaven, which I never spoke to them. I never met them. They sent it to me. I mixed it, sent it back, and they said, "Yeah, great." And it was one of their biggest singles. And no comments, nothing. No comments, nothing. Nothing. I just sent it. Just, and then, yeah, that started happening. And, uh, you know, now it happens a lot. It happens all the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some some bands that come in and I meet them. And, you know, right now I'm working with Journey. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> and so I've been, I mean, I haven't seen them, but I mean, I know them all already so we talk on the phone a lot right so, uh, right so was that part of the impetus for deciding to finally just build your own mix room um that was the reason i did that was uh let me see i just thought it'd be because it was just uh, I kind of wanted to be home. You know what I mean? It's like for years and years, I felt like I, even though I had a place in Woodstock, I had a place in New York. I had a, I was renting an apartment in London. I was renting an apartment in Los Angeles for a couple of years there that I never felt like I had a home. Right. You know, I was just always in hotels most of the time or in some rented apartment. I was never in New York. I had two homes in New York. It was practically never there. And, uh, you know, and then I met my wife, Betty, and she said, well, what are you doing? You're paying rent all over the place and you got two mortgages. And, uh, you know, why don't you just settle down and move here? <laughs> and uh, so, so and then maybe you could we could build a studio and then you won't have to worry about. And that was the other thing. Booking studios is always a, a hassle because you book a room and you spend half the day just getting the room into some kind of shape, figuring out what works and what doesn't. And I mean, back then it, it's easier now because everything's in the box, but back then yeah. it really depended on the gear in the studio. And uh, it got to be, um, you'd spend half the day before you could even start mixing, just setting the room up so you can start. And uh, and then and then it'd be too late. You'd be too tired to finish the mix. And then you'd have to, the next day you'd have to move to another studio and I have to call the cartage guy right. who would charge both record companies, of course, the, <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, it was just like, Oh my God, it'd be so nice just to have one studio that I could set up and it's just always ready to go. And so we did this and it worked and I thought, fantastic. You know, this is great. You know, and, um, and then it just went on from there because when surround came along, 
then I could modify my comp and I kept modifying the desk. It was brand new when I bought it and I just kept adding stuff to it. Right. And, um, so now it's just so now it's really hard to go anyplace else because it's just so custom for me. Yeah. Well, so have you mixed anywhere else recently? I mean, I don't mean like during the pandemic because no one's right. even left their house, no. but. Um, let me see the last thing I did. Oh man, I don't know. No, I mean I mixed the um, Bare Naked Ladies record, but this is a long time ago mm. in Toronto, and I did, did some mods because they wanted the surround mix as well. So I had to do the this crazy um, um, compressor mod on, on their console, and that was really tricky. Um, other than that, no, I've recorded things in other places, and of course, right. But not not really mixed things, and I did some stuff in France for some artists there, but that was years ago as well, and uh, uh, that's about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, there's no reason not to. No, no reason you know, to at and, all. Yeah, that's the thing because everything's online anyway, and there's no there really isn't any reason to to go any other other place. You know, mixed with the masters, of course, wants me to go and do their thing in France, which isn't really mixing; it's just more of a teaching thing yeah yeah but that that would be the only thing and that would not be on an ssl well i know that's the thing that's why i keep hesitating doing that because it's, it's it's become such a part of i mean i've been mixing on a console like this since what 1980 i think since you know? they made them yeah yeah and right exactly and so it's become such a part of what i do and if i tried to do quickly do what i do on this uh, i'd be sitting there thinking okay how would i do that on an 88r you know like, well we were talking before we we came on about you building your studio and that when you first built it you built the shell and then you rented in stings right. ssl in a box does he still have that i mean you'd imagine he probably um, does i guess he does i don't know yeah rent know, that for a seminar it up and, he would set it up in his um he's got this big um place in the south of france someplace where he would record co record a bunch of out records and he used it down there a bunch of times i think but i don't know if he, he still does i mean the, the desk had some problems to be honest. right well you know it would built into road cases yeah. and bumped around all the time yeah that's the problem yeah they're not really designed to do that <laughs> no no it's sort of amazing it ever it ever worked at all yeah all right. Well, we'll come back to to some more geek stuff later. But they're just there are a couple. I'm just going to talk about some of the outlier records, which I was it just seemed weird to even see them on there. And then if there's anything I skip that you want to talk about, just bring it up. But there's a Zach Wild record that you mix. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to hear about that because that's not. I just wouldn't have expected that. But I would imagine that that is a little bit more in your wheelhouse than people think. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a rock record, you know. It's just like a sort of a basic, yeah, rock record, and uh, yeah, it would I mean that's kind of what I do. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, mix rock records, and yeah, he was great. He, I remember him. Yeah, I, I really like. He was pretty funny. You know, <laughs> he had some funny quotes. Something about, um, what did he say? That somebody wondered if he could, um. Turn, turn some something into water into wine, you know, like I'm talking about uh, as a metaphor for making something great out of nothing, you know. And uh, he said, "The best I can do is is turn beer into urine." <laughs> <Something like that. laughs> that sounds very Zach. Yeah, yeah right. I'm talking about his fiddle. Yeah. <laughs> Always talks about his guitar as a fiddle. Yeah, but he was good. I mean, he was, you know, it was. I don't remember how what the record was, but yeah, was well, a good, and a fantastically good talented guitar player too. Really good, really amazing player. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That was a long time ago, man. Yeah, well, and if he uh, had, it's hard to remember some. I know, and <laughs> that's I do why remember him. That's why I'm. I just wanted to ask about some things I was curious about because, all right, so in 2000, you mixed a Bad Religion record that Todd Rundgren produced. Which oh, yeah. somehow I didn't even know that Todd Rundgren had made a Bad Religion record. <laughs> so 
anything you want to say about that would be absolutely fascinating to me because that that pairing is it makes perfect sense but it's unexpected yeah well uh yeah who's the guy in that the, the, the brett name? gerwitz who's no what was the guy was that the guy's name what's his name well brett's the kind of main songwriter in oh, the okay. Band. okay all right yeah i guess it was him that i did it with but uh yeah, that was fun. The the, pro, the thing about that, I mean, Todd, I'm such a Todd Rundgren fan. I always have been, you know, I mean, you know, hello, it's me is the ringtone on my phone, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, I still listen to his records all the time. But I tell you what, him producing a, other as an engineer, <laughs> it's funny because he en he did a great job on the on, on the stage fright album for the band. I thought he did a good job on that, and Robbie didn't think maybe so much, but uh, <laughs> but I thought I thought it was really good. And but this record, all the guitars were recorded through a, um, I think through a pod like a Line Six pod, wow, or something like that, right? And man, it was impossible. <laughs> it was just really difficult to mix it, and uh, you know the guitar sounds were it was such a shame because they didn't deserve they deserved better i think than to do that i don't think he really he just didn't want i don't know if he just didn't want to set up an amp or if he thought oh this is the cool thing this is much better right. sound or what he i don't I no idea i never spoke to him i only spoke to the guy in the band all right and um it was a struggle to to get the guitars to sound like anything right and um so that that was the thing with that record, and it was a great. Re I liked the record; it was really fun, you know, because I liked the band. I thought they were very good. It's it's weird. Todd's got a as a producer, he's got a reputation for making records. That I mean, like he the XTC record Skylarking he produced, I absolutely love. But apparently, Andy Partridge record. hated doing it. Apparently, yeah. But that's that's a fantastic record, though. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. Especially yeah. Dear God, I think it's just a yeah. brilliant piece of music. And that, I mean, and I just think a great that's, arrangement and everything. That's their biggest hit, I would think. Could be, yeah, could be. I was a big fan of them. them. I really wanted to produce them at one point. Yeah. I well, really like that band. And Andy's still around and still writing, so. Is he really? Oh, yeah. that's great. That's good to know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they've brilliant. done an XTC thing in forever, but yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good band. But yeah, yeah I, it's an interesting thing with Todd because I actually personally like a lot of his productions more than his own records, just musically for whatever reason. I don't connect as much with his mm -hmm. stuff, but he seems to make really good records that the bands don't enjoy as much as they might. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, that was an outlier for a reason. Um, there was also a Dweezil Zappa record that you mixed. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know. Now, this was one of Dweezil's earliest records i think it's before he'd really decided he was going to do the i'm frank's son carry on frank's legacy thing so this is more of his right. own thing but i don't know if there's anything in particular about that record um wow i don't actually because i remember him because he was hanging with uh lisa loeb for a while mm -hmm. and there was a lisa loeb record that he worked on and um co-produced but then i must yeah there was a dweezil i don't remember actually doing a dweezil zappa record well really. supposedly ah okay well oh, I, fair enough i remember i remember working with him and but i really liked him he's a good guy but this and, this uh, could just be another internet you know made up thing yeah maybe i don't i don't remember that but i remember working with them we we did a they did a wrote a great song together with lisa and and dweezil that should have been a hit record. I mean, it really, literally, it's called you, you Don't Know Me. And uh, I actually remember the name of the song. And it was just because it was such a good song. And um, it was the Interscope Records. And for some reason, Interscope didn't quite get it. Right. You know, I, remember, I, remember, I remember Jimmy came in and listened to it and said, yeah, wow, sounds like a hit. And that's when, when Jimmy had that, that great quote about uh, Dweezil. I, I, he said... I didn't know I liked your guitar playing so much. <laughs> what? <laughs> what <did you> say? <laughs> I didn't know I liked your guitar playing so much. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> wow. But it, anyway, okay. remember that quote. It was on my website. And um, and then the other guy, Tom Wally, came in and he, they both they both said, oh, well, this sounds like a hit record. Def, definitely. And then they, I don't even think they put it out as a single. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what they did. Because yeah. if any two people can make something a hit record, those I guys know. can do a pretty good job of it. What do you think? Yeah. So I don't know what the problem was. I mean, this really, oh, sorry, sounded like a, a pop hit record, you know, I mean, it had every ingredient. It was right. Perfect. Great, great lyric, great melody. And it was just a fun song to listen to. And, uh, Man, well, I'm well, going to have to go dig it up. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been on, on one of the, um, yeah, one of Lisa's records, I think. Smoke. Right. Okay. So, all right, there's another one, which I have a feeling this is another just internet blip. But in 97, there's a King's X record that's listed on all music. Did okay. you mix a King's X record or did you not? I did. It? You I did. did. Fantastic. Well, yes, I would I love to hear about that. They, for a while, just, I forgot about it, so they, I were, they were one of my um, favorite bands for a while. It's sort of in the earlier, you know, early mm -hmm. 90s, Gretchen okay. Goes to Nebraska days and stuff like that. Yeah. But such a talented talented band and doing mm -hmm. stuff other bands don't do yeah yeah great singer they were they were really good you know but um i can't remember any specific things about it <laughs> it's fine I, mean, I had forgotten until you mentioned it i'd totally forgotten that i'd done it but now i, I do remember that right for sure you know and it was it, it, that was it was a fun project i remember that and they did what you know we do these make a plate things let me I can find. Hang on one sec. Yeah, yeah. And um, I can show you guys my pencil. Sorry about this. Just for a minute. But they did a great, a really good one. I, I have to look for it. But this, this is one that um, that my daughter did for me when she was about <laughs> nine. Can you hold it a little closer? Bob's brain. What's it say under the car? A uh, two blue because it, I I had just bought this a 90, 99 blue uh, BMW M3 and it was really bright blue. And when I when I went to pick up Alex at at school and I said, "What do you think of the car?" She said, "Isn't isn't it too blue?" <laughs> That's great. And so so the name of the car became Two Blue. <laughs> That's brilliant. So, do you have do a lot but, of bands was, make plates? Yeah, but they made they made a real, couple of really good ones. I'd, I'd have to hunt through all the plates to find one for you right now. But, How many plates but, do you uh, have? Do you think there's probably um, about twenty five or thirty? I mean, nobody's really kind of no, nobody's been here lately, so nobody right has done them. But uh, you know, there's a couple of pretty good artists like John Leventhal did like a couple of really good ones, and and you know, there's some pretty interesting ones. That, um, and, and it's kind of fun because it's the souvenir that's that's here in our outdoor kitchen right that we use we actually use them every day <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a fun little thing to do and we i i, I gotta pick it up and do because you just you just draw you, they give you these um special kind of markers and you do it on a round piece of paper and then you mail it off to this company and in a couple of weeks these things come back in in a plate Oh, it's right. like a plastic laminated plate, you know. <laughs> so not it's highly cool. toxic then? No, not at all. No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, all right. So I'm just going to say some more names, and you're going to say whether you remember anything about these <laughs> records or not, and we'll just see what happens. Because then I, I, we can definitely do some geeky talk. So there's a Jonathan Brook record, mm -hmm. which did you co-produce that? Did you do yeah. some pretty? Yeah. Well, there's a few. The, the first one was called Ten Cent Wings, which I just mixed. Right. And um, that she, it was produced by uh, somebody else, um, French guy, forgot his name. But um, and then the next one was um, Steady Pull. She asked me to produce the next one, which is called Steady Pull, which we did right here in the lounge. Right. And um, and there was a couple. There was one called Careful What You Wish For which I co-produced, and then another one called The Works, which is all uh, Woody Guthrie's music that she wrote lyrics to. Right. And then I mixed a few other records for her, too, as well. You know, she's an amazing talent. Yeah. 
You know, I know I keep saying this about all these. I've worked with them, unbelievable people. I mean, she is truly ph phenomenally talented. Talented, you know, because she's kind of a, you know, one of those singer songwriter, female singer songwriters with an acoustic guitar. But a lot of those kind of people, they just kind of strum, you know, they'll, they'll strum a G and a D or whatever, you know what I mean? But she actually makes up tunings for the specific song. Right. She'll go, well, this this is an interesting thing. And she'll change it. No, that's not good. Oh, there we go. And then she'll she'll have to make up chords. Right. With her fingers. Like, how does anybody think that way? There are, there are people, it's amazing how their brains can, like, they relearn the fretboard in seconds. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And then, you know, and so you, you'll hear these, these records where they, they sound like sort of pop songs, but if you really listen to what she's playing, it's really unusual and yet very melodic and very pleasing. It's not, it's not like weird jazz or something. It's, right, right. You know, it's pop music, but. Wow, how do you do that? And then what's really fun is watching her explain what the chord is to like the other guitar player or the bass player. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, because they're sitting there watching her hands, thinking they yeah, know what's going like, on, and like, what, what the, the hell? Yeah, like Val McCallum going, "What the? What are you playing?" It's like, okay, <laughs> man, if Val can't figure it out, it's yeah, got to right. be complicated. I know. That's amazing. So, yeah, so she's amazing, yeah. So when, because, you know, we talked about earlier in your career, you decided for a minute, like, okay, I'm going to be a producer. And then you thought, <laughs> no, I don't want to be a producer. This is not fun. I'm just going to mix. So yeah. what does it take for you to say, okay, to production? Like, did you have to talk yourself into producing with Jonathan or like you just jumped at it because you loved her as an artist? Well, she talked me into it, basically. And uh, I said, you know, I don't really like producing. She goes, you'll be great don't worry about it and you know the thing is that she produces herself you know i'm sort of the engineer and i'm i'm kind of there to bounce ideas off of or kind of kind of push her into what she does you know which i guess is kind of a lot like what a lot of producers do yeah but uh but she's so talented i didn't really have to do that much you know what i mean as right. far as producing and it wasn't some psychological like i had to get this person into a certain state of mind or whatever. And I, and I didn't have to arrange anything. I mean, I always think a good producer is also uh, like a, an arranger and should know, you know, that's, that's the thing. I, one of the reasons I stopped producing is I can't go over to a piano and say, Oh, try playing this chord. You know? Right. It's, I know music and I can hear stuff, but I'm not, Unfortunately, I never learned to play piano when I was a kid. Well, Just there are a it. lot of producers who don't do that and some ridiculously yeah. successful ones who don't do that. Yeah, I know. And I just didn't think I was good enough and I didn't have the patience for it. And, then, and the other thing is, I mean, I just like the, the mixing part. But but with her, it was just because we were became good friends on the first album that I mixed for her. And so it was more, it was just like a friend a friendly thing. And we were... You know, it was really no pressure with her, really. Right. No, uh, it was just very relaxed. And was it and sort it was of an fun. organic thing where she'd say, "Hey, I've got a song, and let's do it," or did you actually book it out yeah. like a like a project? Oh no, we booked it. I booked it as a project. Yeah, yeah, I definitely did. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you're underestimating your input as a producer on that. But do you do you look back at those records and really kind of see? <laughs> what your contribution as a producer was or do you not even really see it hard to say uh, i don't know i mean i i hear the obviously the sounds i'm i'm responsible for the sounds for sure you know and uh, uh yeah you know here and there there's some things that i i kind of added you know but uh i don't know you know i don't it's, yeah, think I think about. it's it's um, it sounds like I mean you were there just to keep her focus, just to like you had the idea of what the record was, and that way she could get lost yeah. in the details. Kind of, yeah, I guess. Or or not, I just made that you up. Know. I could be wrong. <laughs> or I, I I just have her try different things, you know, like doing harmonies. Oh, try this. Okay, try uh, you know, um, a fifth below. Try try a 
third above or whatever, you know, try, try different things. And then, oh, that works. <laughs> you know right. I mean? Or, you know, we, we do, I remember there was one song on one of the albums where she was trying to come up with a bridge. She hadn't quite gotten the bridge chords and she try like, well, what about this? What about that? And then when she, she played the one that sounded right, I got that one. <laughs> right. Know? that kind of thing well and that's huge that that's a big eh, deal i know it's huge it is big it's big 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 so do you enjoy recording in those situations you enjoy getting back to it like said again just at engineering just went the sound, sound went out oh sorry do you do you enjoy engineering actually the recording part of it when you're producing a record like that um sometimes <laughs> I like the first part of it. I like the like like getting the drum sounds. I like doing that. Right. And then I wish somebody else would take it. Right. Over. No, not not the tape hopping part. So the actual just engineering part. Yeah. Yeah. And and um to be honest, uh, for me, it it started to get get boring, especially like doing vocal overdubs where I mean, Jonathan was amazing cuz she do four takes and well, they're all perfect. <laughs> right. But but when you have to kind of do 10 takes and then comp and then do 10 more takes and then comp and you know, no, you're a little flat, you're a little sharp, you know, you put you're rushing the beat or whatever, you know, it's like, and this is just tedious for me. Yeah. And and I I'd, I'd rather be sitting there doing it and somebody saying that to me. So oh well, no, that 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 mix isn't good. Can you try this? Okay, yeah, I'll try that. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I, I'm better at taking direction than giving it. Right. That's what I'm saying. Interesting. You know, which is kind of pathetic, I guess. No, no, not <laughs> at all. Because, I mean, look, the, your first pass on a mix, though, is full of your direction. Yeah, so, right. Okay. You know, it's, but it's also, in some ways, it's a little bit of the safety net of they are going to come back and say whether or not, you know, it's all right or not or whatever. But yeah. It's it's not like you're not doing anything. You're not just like, hey, I balanced your tracks exactly like you gave them to me. What do you think? No, I mean, you're... No, no. I usually try to do, you know, add something right. when, when I'm mixing. It's just that, that telling somebody, you know what I mean? It's that it's the whole social interaction or, or trying to get somebody to, to perform a certain way, right? which I, I just don't like to have to do that. Yeah, it's a weird psychological gig. It, yeah, like I like do actually doing it. Like when I'm, I'm more of a hands-on than a just right. ta- telling somebody what to do. Right. Um, there are other records which we'll talk about in a sec, but let's talk about because we talked a little bit about you building your studio, but let's talk about the studio at Apogee mm-hmm. that you've got as well because that's totally different and used yeah, for totally different things. Different. So totally you want to talk about putting that together and why and where the desk came from and what it's used for now? Because it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, well, you know, it's my wife's building, Apogee. Of course, she's CEO and boss and everything. And um, But we had this extra space that was really just being used for storage. Because it's it's basically a 10,000 square foot building. 5,000 of it is basically the Apogee offices on the left. On the right, the, the back part of that is the warehouse and there's a lab where they, of course, Apogee gear never breaks, but in case something did break, Just, they, that's where they'd fix it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's a it's a hypothetical rhetorical department, but yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> but then the front part of that was was just this. Um, there was a little office in the front, and it was just a big empty space. It was like a loading bay, and uh, so I, you know. I thought, man, this would make it, what a great room. I could just picture the studio being in this room and uh, went into to the wife's office and sat down on her couch and said, look, you know, it's a big waste of space over there. It's just a bunch of crap in there. It'd be nice to just throw, turn it into a little studio, like a garage studio, just a cheap thing where we could re- record punk bands in there or something. Yeah, all right. She's, she's like, you get out of my office and stop bothering me you build a studio <laughs> you know? and so um it turned into a little bit more than that we actually hired a a company to build it some friends of ours and um 
then I really got into designing it. I got, had George Augsburger come in and help me a little bit with the, the shape of the control room and, and uh, you know, went through a lot of different plans. But the thing is, I always had this idea in my head to make a studio that was a sort of recording studio, but performance venue as well. You know, like, like a small club or something like that. Because there's lots of these little clubs around town here where, that are smaller than, or the same size or smaller than yeah. the Apogee studio. And uh, so I thought, okay, we'll have a stage over in one corner and then opposite the, the stage, we'll, we'll have the control room and uh, it'll be this sort of this odd shape because it really was just a, a square area. So we had to kind of break it up and we built the thing. And the funny thing was that on the plan, I drew this little idea for a stage. And when the construction guys came in, that must have been the easiest thing to start with. So they that was the first thing they built. <laughs> oh, we have a stage. I had that was just an idea, you know. Right. <laughs> like I hadn't really figured out what how big it was gonna be. It was just I just drew something. And um, all right, and then they built we built the rest of the thing and we needed a console for it. And well, we could get one of these new SSL AWS S eight hundreds or something like that. And um, what should we, you know, it'd be so cool to have one of those old Neves like we had at Power Station in eighty sixty eight, because they're so easy to 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 operate and and like having a vintage console would be a fun thing to do. And so Betty knew I was looking for that, so she had one of her guys on it, right. And uh, like searching the internet, and then then I was looking for for one too. She, I don't think she even really. I might not have even told her. I think she just knew what I wanted. Right. Somehow, I don't know, but uh, we both found the same one. <laughs> you know, I I, I just typed in a, Neve eighty sixty eight, and this thing came up. I said, "Oh, the original Studio A Power uh, sixty eight from Power Station." like wow that's exactly the one <laughs> you know i'd made all these records on it I yeah made, um, uh, springsteen and bowie and 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 uh brian adams and a ton of other records you know were made on that that was the first console amazing we had there. and uh and where had it so been I, well it, it, it was in storage for a while because they got a bigger one they they had replaced it with an 8088 which is right. the same desk but 10 more channels and uh, and then they sold it to a guy named Steve Ripley in Oklahoma, and he had it in his studio. Had this band called the Tractors, and um, so then he had it. Uh, what you call it? That's so. That's who sold it to me. Right. And he had Fred Hill come in and recap it and rebalance the stereo bus. It did a bunch of work to it, and added flying faders as well. It never had any automation. And um, so, but the thing was that Betty and I were kind of sort of bidding against each other and didn't know it. <laughs> oh, no. So I didn't know she was looking for it and she didn't know I was looking for it. Oh, you're joking. Right? Yeah. And the guy was saying, well, there's just this one other person that's interested in it. Right. <laughs> it so how much did you cost each other? Uh, well, I still got it like five <laughs> grand less than what he was asking. So right. it was not too bad. I mean, I might have gotten you know, another five off of it. Right. Which, but, uh, you know, that's fine. Yeah, it was fine. You know, when then Lucas from Apogee went out and looked, went to Oklahoma and checked it out and we just authenticated that it was actually that, that the, the original console, then Eddie Evans from, um, from power station, who was the Tad tech at power station actually sent me a drawing of the schematic. Oh, fantastic. On the, on the wall at power station now too which is nice so he authenticated it as well he knew it really well right because he had to fix it all the time <laughs> but anyway so it's it's sitting it just sounds amazing we've um we've upgraded it i did i did a um fader flip so that because i'm mixing radio shows you know that console was the first inline console that that neve ever made yeah so the monitor mixes on these little knobs yeah on the on the channels and the 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 mics came up the faders. Well, obviously for mixing a radio show, you don't want to mess with, 
because you're recording multi-track at the same time. So you don't want to mess with that. You just want to control the monitor fader. So we did a fader flip, which is pretty intense yeah. modification on that desk, you know, and then a bunch of other mods that we came up with. So it's pretty heavily, heavily modded. As are but most still, of them. Yeah. Yeah. The, you kind of have to, because they're so basic. I mean, Neve didn't know, didn't understand about, um, an inline desk and and was it, it a, was it a mark one or a mark two i'm going to be geeky because i own one too that's the original mark one so mark one modified. so that that didn't have all it didn't have a remix mode there's all sorts of stuff that the mark two no. had that it didn't have yeah yeah well that was added we it, we yeah i think power station added the, the the remix mode right you know so it didn't and did originally have that even though it was a, a mark one originally it was all modified right but still, one of the one of the most flexible mixing consoles. Once you've got those few mods done, I mean, eight sends, two stereo, yeah, four mono, right. sixteen bus. You know, the input hits absolutely everything. Quad mix bus, like it's they're yeah. pretty badass. It's good, and it's so you know that equalizer is so easy because you just you don't even have to look at it. You just you click the thing, you know, two stops over and turn it. You know, yeah, it's it's so fast to set up. You can set, you can get a session going. It's such a great recording desk because you can get a session going in, you know, yeah. fifteen minutes easily. And you want to talk a little bit about all the radio shows because I mean it, it gets used pretty regularly now, right? Yeah, well, we've done close to somewhere around a hundred radio shows for uh, for KCRW, and they um, they come up with the bands. They're usually bands that have an album about to come out or. You know, they just happen to be in town or something like that, and we we had no control over who who was coming in, even even though I would suggest people. But uh, and um, it's really fun because it's, it's you get about 150 to 180 people standing room in the um, in the room, and it's like a party. We were doing these all the time. I mean, maybe once, average about once a month, maybe right. it wasn't regular, but it was. We had a couple of bars. They would set up a couple of bars, so there were drinks and and um, it was it's just fun. I can't wait until it starts up again, right? Because I really miss it. I mean, I would it would be a whole day. Obviously, we'd come in in the morning, set up. We'd have to. Uh, there was always this conflict with the the warehouse because you know all the mic stands and there was all this stuff in the in there that had to move out because we get a lot of people and we have to find places to put all that junk in the in the warehouse and it was always a bit of a conflict with the warehouse guys like well, can you wait till a little later <laughs> you know? and um he'd set up and then we'd set the room up and do a sound check in the afternoon and then we'd usually have to do radio eye dance at some point before dinner and and then do the show at night and it, it was always fun they do they usually do half a set and then the dj would do a like a 20 minute interview with the band and then and then the rest the rest of the set right and people just have so much fun i mean it's just i especially me i have the most fun because i get to mix the thing live right you know i'm sort of kind of and i always let the doors are open to the control room so go there'd always be people sitting behind me so i always felt like i was part of the show right that's great <laughs> kind of, you know it's just it's just fun you know just surrounded by people and and uh and they're all going out live well, no, no, it's, uh, there was only one so, that went out live. Okay. Just so they're recorded. All they take my live mix, but, um, and then they'd edit it later because it had to fit into a one hour show. Right. And, uh, and the only live one we did was, was for the um, um, Alabama Shakes, which is really incredible. You know, hopefully when we start back, I, I, I hope I, we can do, well, we're going to pro probably start doing our own live shows. Right. I think if we can, if we can get bands to do it, because um, we have a full video set up now. And so oh, right. All that are, we can do it all ourselves. And because um, they would, they bring in a, a company to do the video. And, uh, but it's, it's just fun. I mean, and it's invitation only. So it isn't a general public thing. Right. Fortunately, so maybe I shouldn't be talking about it. I don't know what people get annoyed <laughs> when they can't. How come we can't get in? No, it's a <laughs> it's a private thing. That's yeah, fine. it really is. It's mainly for donors for KCRW donors, right? Mm -hmm. And do you find yourself mixing 
completely differently for those? I mean, obviously it's a totally different desk, but is it much, much simpler and you're really mixing it like front of house sort of thing? Or Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like doing a, um, you know, I've done a ton, a whole ton of um, TV festivals, you know what I mean? Like yeah. Live Aid and all these kinds of things. And so it's like, it's just like that. And you keep it really simple. I mean, I have a million different effects going on. You know, when I, I set up a mix here, I have all my delays and, re, you know, four or five different types of, or six different types of reverb. You know, this thing, I have one reverb basically. Right. I've got a 480, got this 480L. I either use that or I use something in the box if, um, if I have a spare computer. And, uh, and, uh, my cat, sorry, my cat is scaring me. She's like, Whoa, should we meet your cat? Yeah, here. There is a fantastic interview of you sitting on one of those kneeling chairs with your cat curled up the entire time. Hello. That's Walter. Hey, Walter. <laughs> oh, okay. He's, he's out. And, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, so any, I don't know what else to say about it, but it's, you know, it's just a fun day. Yeah. And I, and I take a day off. I get out. It's a, it's a way to get out of the basement, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's got to be super refreshing to do it. There we go. There's Walter. Yeah, I don't know where my guys are. They're usually jumping up and down. Something. Walter is not Look, having Andrew. it. Andrew. Need Andrew. Hi, Walter. Look, I got a I got a cat thing over there that my cats I know, won't I use. That. They refuse to use it. So you could come really? over and use it if you wanted. I think he had a look. <laughs> I I don't think he has much uh, much time for my cats that don't use it. So so that's that's awesome to just build that because it's it's a really great space. I've I've been over there a couple of times and it's yeah oh, good it's really cool. And I'm assuming yeah, I, hope, I hope you can come to one of the shows. Yeah, you know? well I, I'm I, at this point I don't even think I'm allowed to come into the country, let alone go to oh, a really? show. So yeah, UK is a restricted uh, travel. Oh right, yeah, sure. Thing. Well, hopefully that'll change soon. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely hope so. Um, mm. What was I? I was going to say something, but it wasn't very. I'm sure it was a whole lot of nothing, really. Um, oh, I was just going to say. I, I would imagine because we talked about uh, there was a question last time about having to mix a live show without good room mics. I'd imagine you've got some good crowd mics going. Oh yeah, yeah. Got a couple. I think the latest. Um, I was using a couple of KM86s hanging from the ceiling. Now, I think the I'm using the 86s for other things, and I got a couple of uh, AKG 414s because I don't think they're good for much of anything else, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they work all right for a crowd. <laughs> well, it's one of the few microphones you can actually stuff inside the bridge of a double bass. So that makes sense. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. That, that's that. kind of cool using it like a PZM yeah, right. when you get an upright player who's moving around all over the place. It's a step up from a DI. That's a good idea. Oh, that's a good idea. I used to use a, um, what is it? Uh, an 81. Raw right, with the, with the angle. Is that the one with no, the No, just the 81. I would, I would wrap it in, it's back in media sound. I would wrap it in foam. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a Neumann 81 and just shove it. At, uh, oh no, not in the bass. Sorry, in, in a harp. We used to use, put that in a harp. But the bass, yeah, that's a good idea with the bass. I like that. So you use a, a four fourteen. Yeah, yeah, four fourteen because the capsule's pointing right at the body. It's right not a great the, sound, but it's. But that makes sense. It's yeah. way better than a pickup. Yeah, yeah I bet. I try that next time because, man, upright bass is always a challenge. It is. I mean, yeah. that talking about Al Schmidt, that's the one thing that he made sound it's amazing, astounding. Yeah. And I've watched, you know, how he did it, and yeah. I've tried the same thing, and it's, you know, it kind of works for me. But you know, well, two M one forty nines for anyone listening, because Al's not going to be interviewed about it anymore. So two M one forty nines, one by the bridge, one up by the fingers. Oh yeah, and they would just okay. always magically be in phase perfectly, right. and even you know whatever was loud in one mic would be quiet and like just perfect. Right, and it was that and vocal were the only things I ever saw him use a limiter on while recording. Oh yeah, 
And it was right. always the, um, was it the ADLs? But again, like Steve Jenowick talked about it, you know, the meters, mm-hmm. like, yeah, okay. I'm not really. <laughs> Great. But yeah, upright bass is tough. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah. I tried to get upright bass on one of my sample CDs. And I, I rented a bass and you really need a good bass. To yes. Do that. And then I just gave up. I just and a really good player too. Well, that would help. for sure (laughs) yeah yeah it is all about the tone all right uh we're going to talk about a couple more records because we have to because they're records that you worked on and one of them is the bob marley legend record in surround Mm. let's Ah. talk about that because that's that must have been like a pretty cool call to get about as cool as it gets really (laughs) you know i mean they call me the label calls me up and says, oh, would you be interested in doing a surround mix of, of Bob Marley's Legend album? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? See, how fast can I answer? <laughs> yeah. You know? And and uh, so how, okay, well, how much do I have to pay you to mix that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, we're going to pay you. Really? <laughs> you know, and so, uh, yeah, that was amazing. And that's something that, that's part of our little show when, when when Betty brings Apogee clients over, I play that for him in the studio because it's just so much fun to listen to. Right. You know, it's just great. I mean, and and they kind of let me do what I wanted. There was only one time when the A&R guy came in and said, oh, couldn't you put the backing vocals in the rear speakers? And I go, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> that was like the only comment they, they made on one song. Right. You know, but it was great. The, the problem with that album is that that some of them, you know, a couple of the multi tracks were missing, and one of them was kind of pretty destroyed. You know, it's kind of, I had to stick it through a whole bunch of isotope stuff to get it to be even playable, you know. Right. And um, so that, that was too bad. So, so a couple of the things on the album are outtakes and, you know, just various, just not the right, the right thing, but the, you know, the, the good stuff is like really good and it's just so much fun to listen to and so much fun to do yeah you know, to put those tracks up it was incredibly well recorded you know and that's like back in the 70s and 80s you know late yeah 70s, early now, 80s. i should know this but is that one of the ones that he started on eight track in jamaica and then brought it over to ireland and transferred to 16 for overdubs because a bunch of the records were done that way but i don't know with that could could be some of the songs i mean that's the greatest hits album so it was over a span of yeah so i guess yes yeah, some years. of them would be yeah yeah you know yeah. so some of i i don't really know you know i don't it didn't come with a history of recording right unfortunately. and was it was it just for a 5-1 release during the 5-1 yeah. days so they hadn't like redone stereos or anything like that this was just to well, create a 5-1 I did the stereo as well. So there is, a, you know, I always do both at the same right. time. And so there, I think on the, on the Blu-ray, I think there's my stereo mixes on there. I think, I don't remember now, Right. but it's mainly, you know, mainly the five one is what they were looking for. So how long did it take to get used to putting up his vocal track? Like <laughs> about a minute, <laughs> but I mean, uh, it's just the kind of thing where I think I would constantly just get goosebumps, like over and over and over and well, over. Well, yeah, it yeah, would... you kind of do. Yeah, it's like incredible to listen to, but uh, just the whole thing, you know, not just his voice, but that band is yeah, it's just they're so good, uh, you, you know, and and it's and to be able to hear it, I wish everybody could hear that that album in five one. I mean, it's a shame they didn't promote it and people don't know about it because, uh, I, and I might, you know, I don't know, I might even just go back and remix it myself in, in Atmos just so, because that's become the, the big thing. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Well, I think you should, <laughs> and then you should send it to me so I can listen to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they'll ask me to, to do that who knows you should ask but, uh, them because i look the services are starving for content well. yeah and if you can start cranking things out yeah yeah and i would gladly you know check out the mixes if you need anyone to check them out yeah 
Have have you heard this at all by any chance that five one? Is- no, I haven't. I've I've never had a setup for five one ever. Uh, so the once the surrounds are up for Atmos will be the first time I'll actually even have a five one setup. Right. Oh right, all right. Yeah, it's really it's. I mean, people come over and and it blows their minds. It really does. It's it's really fun to watch people's faces, especially especially Marley fans. Right. You know, they come in and they listen. And they go, oh, holy shit <laughs> that's amazing I just can't believe it yeah have because you, it's great because you can you can go what's really nice is is you can go and hear if you want to hear what the organ player is doing you can go back next to that speaker or the piano player and you know and and then it's cool to walk around the room and get different perspectives on what these guys are playing and right it's not the kind of thing where you always just want to sit in the middle right that's yeah that's cool but just you know so hearing it from outside sometimes and from different places you and get is, different perspectives it, on, on is what, that the way you happens. generally approach the five one is to split things up or do you build sort of a soundscape or how how do you generally approach the five one versus the stereo i i the way i like to see i'm very visual and i like to see people standing in places like i i, I want to hear a guitar player over there and i want to hear the keyboard player maybe stereo in the back or right you know what i mean it's like it's it's like i really don't like it to be vague right <laughs> i like it to be very um sort of distinct and and everybody i i, I just think that's fun to where you're sitting it sounds like you're sitting in the room in the middle of a recording session right and they're all sit, sitting around you you know, of course, that that's probably never how ha- it never would have ever sounded like that because there's a lot of overdubs and whatever. But just the illusion of that these guys are all sitting in a circle around me, and uh, right, and, you know, I, I just I just like that. Yeah, I think that's that makes it more fun to me than just some big vague, you know, right, like a wider stereo thing. Yeah, yeah, like that doesn't interest me. That's funny. Yeah, you and and Elliot Shiner and Alan Parsons really are the same. Very much yeah. about being able to move something, as yeah. opposed to just make it a little bit bigger. So it's interesting. Right. And do you ever find? I'm just asking for myself, though. Hopefully, someone else who's watching this will be interested. Do you find any problems as you start to break apart the instrumental arrangement where? if you move too far out of the center, all of a sudden the song kind of goes away or how do you keep it so that you really feel like you can have a large listening position while you've split stuff up like that? Uh, well, it depends on, on the kind of music. Some things, like I just mixed something that was a sort of an eighties rock thing recently and it didn't work so well. It didn't work as well. The stereo sounded better. Right. You know, and uh, where it was all kind of, one thing and uh you know what once it it got spread out it, it it lost some lost a bit of impact i thought you know it just depends it's weird how some things just don't necessarily work most things do though right but most of the things because i've been doing this for five one for 20 years now and most most of the stuff that i've done you listen in in five one or surround and wow i wish everybody could hear that right (laughs) you know right it's just better it's just more more i mean fun to listen to you print absolutely everything in five one for yourself but like what percentage of that stuff has gotten released (laughs) well the for early years there were a few you know bon jovi released one the indigo girls um there were a a few others um uh bare naked ladies um and then there was a bunch of others that there were there were a bunch that did come out and then just dropped off i mean that that just it was a, like a fad for a while right but i just kept doing it because it was fun for me and i thought well they're they're there if anybody wants them right and um so yeah maybe uh 10 percent or five percent even wow you know but now people are starting to ask for atmos and, yeah and uh you know and then the 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 band all i've done all the the first four band albums in 
well, the first three in 5.1 and now this last one in uh, Atmos. And so they specifically wanted that. Right. Great. I was just thinking about it and I wonder how much of it is to do, because you mentioned like a, a more of a rock thing where most likely guitars and bass are playing the same riff and there are things that are doubled and whatever. And if you don't mm -hmm. have discrete parts, then splitting things up is just going to sort of diminish like the riff can't be as big if it's split across the whole room as opposed to being all piled up on top of each other. But you talk about a crowded house record or something with lots of individual counter yeah, melodies and overdubs and yeah. That, that kind of thing works better uh, in my opinion. Right. You know, although some of this rock stuff, like I did this one thing where they had like clean guitars doubled in the front speakers and then they had like these sort of power chords come in in the side speakers and then the keyboards in the back. And that kind of, it kind of works, you know? So it's all sort of stereo, really. It's like a right. big, wide, deeper stereo. <laughs> but, you know, and then the voice in the front, the drums in the front. And then, you know, I mean, I don't really do much panning, like mm -hmm. just moving, moving stuff around. Every once in a while, I do have some fun with something, but. Right, mostly you know. just static. Yeah, it's mostly static, yeah. Yeah, which I think is, I mean, you know, it, unless it's an effect, to have it move is just distracting. It's like turning it up by 10 dB. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily right. what you want. And then the delays are, are always, you know, I'll, I'll put the delays in the back usually, or, or the opposite, you know, so I'll have something in the back that's delayed to the front, that kind of thing. So there's this spaciousness that's drum... This, the drum room mics go in the back right so you you feel like you're in the room that's why i always like to have stereo room mics you know people go oh fuck you the mono room mic is cool man yeah okay fine yeah but you're obviously not mixing surround yeah just, just sticking one in the back it's kind of boring if you have stereo in the back now it sounds like you're in a room you know? right it is also hard to find drum rooms where the left and right room mics would sound remotely like each other too. I, well, I get so many where, where yeah, all that we have four room mics. Yeah, I got a close one, a uh, mid one, one all the way in the back, and then one out in the bathroom. Right. <laughs> okay, what good does that do me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just give me one pair that are in the kind of the back of the room, please. Right. <laughs> That's all I ask. <laughs> All right, well, here I'm going to ask another oh, no. geeky question. I feel like we've gotten into the geeky Q&A first. So given a decent-sounding mono room mic, yeah. how do you split it out to stereo? Or do you not bother trying? No, I don't. You don't no, process. Just You'll mono. just leave it mono. Yeah, I'll right. put that in the middle in the back, I guess. And then I'll put, I'll put, my, I'll put the Apogee Ambience um, impulse response on it. Usually. Right. So that kind of makes it stereo. Right, right. Sort of remiking in a way. Yeah. And then the surround, because that's that's really just a, a short ambience. And so you like if you put in a drum room mic in there, it, it kind of works. Right. And then that in in the surround or in the atmos, it's a quad ambience that goes in the ceiling. Speakers. Oh right, you put it up in the height speakers. Wow. Yeah, which is nice. And I'd imagine so that that this... is not available. That impulse response. That's in your library. Uh. No, that's not. No, actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an alto verb that we did ourselves. Right. Yeah, and yeah. It, but it will be one of these days if we can ever start get. We have plans for a um, a surround slash Atmos uh, version of Clear Mountains Domain. Right. But it's it's a ways off, unfortunately, because. Can I suggest you speed up that development cycle? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I just had a meeting this morning, and uh, with these guys, and they're they're trying desperately to get you know, the latest um, version of their the Symphony desktop out, and so they're all working right. on that. And there's just a couple of you know, it's not it's such a tiny company, and people go, "Well, why don't you get this stuff out quicker?" It's like, okay, you try it with like four engineers. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even the big companies, it happens with Avid all the time where you talk to them about something like, yes, that would be great. And if you want us to do that, we would have to not do this, 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 and this. Right. That's the problem. That's, exact, that's exactly yeah. right. And they got a ton of guys up there, I'm sure. Yeah, but I mean, Apogee's I'm sure it's more than four, really, but yeah. Apogee's really small and, you know, and they do it all in-house. It's all, you know, they, they have a couple guys that they, that they, 
couple of contractors that they hire outside, but they're just one or two engineers really. They're not, it's not like a whole, <laughs> you know, you got like 40 engineers working on something. Right. That's, that's not it. <laughs> so with the plugins that you've worked on with them, are these things that they have said, people are going to want these and then you can help or are you building plugins that you want to exist? No, no, it's stuff that I want. Yeah, this, um, I mean, the domain is just an idea that my assistant Sergio came up with it. He said, you know, it'd be great if it was a plugin that would do, because I tried to, because he tried, would try in the box to do what I do with all these delays and reverbs and things. And he says, it's really hard to make that all work in the box. It's, a, it's really complicated. If, we could, if, if there was a plugin that would do all that, it would be it would probably be a pretty cool thing and so that's how that came about and I, and I went to they were just starting to do plugins at apogee right and they said well let's do this and that that was that you and know? it is it's pretty great but yeah i mean that's definitely something it gets overlooked for plugins a lot because that was one of the ones i did with waves was the same thing it's not the sounds it's making it's the crazy routing stuff that's happening inside that yeah. would just, it would take you 12 oxes and a bunch of sends with cross feedback and you'd just get exactly. yourself into trouble. So contain really it, a couple easy. of knobs. Yeah, and then the next version is going to be a, quite a bit more. There's a lot more to it because I I noticed a whole bunch of flaws in it, you know, because I use them all the time. I thought, oh, I wish it would do this and I wish such and such. And, and so we're making that better. And then if we can make it, you know, we're like with six outputs. That kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, even even just five is enough to sort of spread it to the bed or whatever. Yeah. But this will be six, six outputs and, and we have it all planned out. It's just a matter of now giving it to the software. The software girls are just so um, overbooked at the moment. Right. You know. Yeah. I can only imagine. Get this other stuff done. It's a lot to do. So look um there there are other records but it just seems silly for me to just keep saying band names so i've got to have left out some stuff that is like what are some highlights of the last 10 years or so that you think like man let's talk about that record i know i'm putting all the work on you but well the uh, two the, the two sean colvin records where i thought, thought mm. were really good you know it's a few small repairs the sunny came home I mean that that was pretty special. I mean, between Sean is fantastic, I think, and uh, yeah, and uh, um, uh, Leventhal. Uh, I forgot his first name. <laughs> but um, really, I think I think there's some really good records. Her the the, the next record after a, sm a few small repairs called a whole new you. I think is actually a better album, but um, didn't sell nearly as much. And, right. Uh, and then, you know, they kind of, the label didn't really push it very hard for some reason. I don't know why. But anyway, those two, I thought those two records were really, I was quite proud of those. Um, let's see what else. Um, well, I mean, we didn't really even talk about Amy Mann. We, we oh, sort of yeah, skipped right over her, which is not a little unfair. Well, it's a few small repairs is one of my favorite records I've ever mixed. I think. Right. Uh, oh no, sorry. That that's that's I'm mixing Sean. Yes, yeah. that's Sean Tobin. Uh, what's was her first album was? Um, man, I can't believe it. Well, there's whatever in whatever. That's yeah, it. yeah. That's the one that's amazing. I think. You know. And then the next one is called, no oh man, Bachelor Number Two. Is that it? I think do, so. Do you have them? I don't have that yeah. one written down. I'm terrible with but this. Those two records, I think, are, are pretty incredible. And I, I, I wish I was still working with her. I don't know what happened, but uh, she ended up actually she ended up working with Ryan Freeland, who was my assistant. Right. Which is great. I'm really happy about that. But um, she's a pretty brilliant songwriter, I think. Yeah. You know, and those, those were fun. Um, but whatever was like, you know, John Bryan produced it. And 
my favorite song on that is was the first single, which is uh, so that I should have known. I should have known. Yeah, and uh, that was an interesting thing because they John Bryan thought it was a disaster. He thought he really screwed it up because he put way too much. He, you know, he just put there were so many crazy guitars on it and crazy sounds and and I remember they went out to dinner. Um, um, the two of them went out to dinner and I fell asleep while they, the assistant was setting it up. And um, yeah, John and, and Amy went out and when they came back, no, I, I guess I guess I was sleeping, they left a note on my chest <laughs> saying, just apologizing for the production and what a mess it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. You're going to really hate this and you're going to have a hell, hell of a time trying to mix this thing. All right. And so I woke up and I put the thing up and I put up a rough mix and I mixed it in an hour. Wow. I mean, I just pushed everything up and this sounds great. What's the problem? <laughs> you know, like an hour and a half or something. They came back and it was done and they'd listened to it and they went, wow, that sounds fantastic. What did you do? I said, they couldn't believe it. They, they just thought I would, I would be there for days trying to, way through the thing wow <laughs> but just it all worked i mean john bryan is a genius I yeah mean, the guy's like ridiculous absolutely you know, and, uh, but i mean so you could cool believe that he'd and... put too many things on something too because <laughs> yeah. he doesn't ever want to he... stop recording i mean that's no, all he just... wants to do is play he goes on forever but i mean just listen to the, the guitar solos are like the most melodic things he came up with and it's just there's so much in that record that it's just it's brilliant you know, the little breakdown, the little uh, middle section where all of a sudden it goes to like oboes and stuff. It's like, what the? Yeah. Like, what kind of brain works like that? Yeah. And for those of the people it's watching, so it's the good. first track on the uh, on the Perspiration Whatever. playlist. So definitely. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That you made. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. First track on your playlist. Um, and I but think that whole album is amazing, you know? I yeah. mean, there's that one song called uh, Mr. Harris, I think it's, and, you know, it's but <laughs> this woman who has a, this young girl that meets this retired guy out in his front yard who's like watering his plants and falls in love with him. And, you know, there's like 50 years between them and, and uh, it's this little, it's this a great little story. <laughs> you know i mean her lyrics are fantastic yeah she she's a really fantastic writer and, and there's another song called 30 years after the fair which is about the the world's fair the new york world's fair in 1939 and uh or 50 years after the fair that's right because at the time it was 50 years and and she says you know it's like it's like the perfect world across the river in queens you know <laughs> <laughs> It's just great lyrics. He's just really smart. Yeah. And to so, write a song about that, you know, like who writes a song about the 39 World's Fair? Right. You know? Well, unless I you're like that. a Mets fan and spend your life <laughs> yeah, driving right. past that globe thing. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, so you spent an hour mixing I Should Have Known, but you remember everything about it. So it, is this a record that you've listened to a lot since then, or is it just I, one that implanted itself? I do listen to it. That's one one of the few records that I've done that I, I listen to quite a bit. You know, so just, so what's the what's the short list of the records you've done that you you still listen to? I would imagine Squeeze. Yeah, Squeeze. Yeah, and sure. the Crowded House. Crowded House. Yeah, those are the type of things that I I really like. Um, you know, a couple of the Brian Adams things I like. You know, uh, let me see. Um, pretenders right of course my favorite pretenders records were the three that they did before <laughs> before i got to work with them <laughs> yeah. and my favorite crowded house record is the, the first one that i didn't work on as well right you know but uh uh yeah like what else would well let me ask you a question that you probably won't want to answer so what of the five million records that you've mixed are you the proudest of the mixes on? Do you think like, holy shit, I nailed that. Like that just 
Because so many of the records are so big and wide and spacious and things, but what are the ones where you're like impressed with yourself as a mixer? And I know it it's happened as much as you'll say, oh, it's just about the records. And But there there are times when you know that you've just nailed it. And I'm curious what what on your list is in that category. Ooh, boy, that's, that's a tough one. Um, uh, I think those Sean Colvin albums were one of the things. Right. You know, but of course, John Le Leventhal, it's more because of him, because he's such a good, great arranger. They were, they were easy to mix. And they're all done on ADATs too, by the way. Wow. Which is kind of freaky. Um, Avalon, I think, you know. Yeah, There's I think a, a lot of people would on, agree with you. On Avalon. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, boy, that's a, that's a tough one. I right? know. I mean, I'm, I'm, but you, I, I sent you a list of things. Yeah, you well, you sent me a list of the stuff that you worked with. So on the list is Amy Mann, Crowded House, Pretenders, Brian Adams, Springsteen, uh, Tougher Than the Rest, Small yeah, Stars. Right. We haven't talked about Small Stars. Oh, oh, that's a good one. All right, let's talk about Small Stars for a second. You've probably never heard that. I'm sure. I have not. No, not until you sent me the list. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty obscure. I mean, that's a, a guy named Miles Zuniga from um, Fastball. Remember the band Fastball? Yeah. They had a uh, was I can't remember. They had a big hit that Chris. I think Chris mixed, and um, but then I mixed the next couple albums for fastball and then there's this offshoot that that miles did called the small stars and and they were like it's almost kind of like the ramones where they they were all characters they they were they, they, they this band of, of people from they were like losers basically the, their characters of course from um they're not just gamblers from vegas but they they're from reno <laughs> Right. And, and so it's it's that sort of vibe and they all they all had character names i can't remember what what they were what their names were but um and it's just this fantastic album i mean that miles is brilliant he's another brilliant songwriter that, that nobody knows about you know he, he lives in austin and uh he just makes these records every now and then he'll call me up and say, look I, I made another record and uh, you, you got to mix this for me. And, and I just, some of my favorite stuff to do. And it's completely obscure and uh, really fun. And this, the, the, that one album, the, the Small Stars album, it's got a, a song called Let's Hit the Town, which is just should be, a, should have been a huge <laughs> hit. And uh, they actually played at one of our Apogee parties. All right. Just, people love them. Yeah. It was just one of the biggest, huge highlight. Yeah. And then they, they, you know, they're not together anymore, I don't think. And uh, nobody paid that much attention. Right. That's and a it's shame. too bad because if you, the, the, the album is called Tijuana Dreams. If anybody goes and finds it, I mean, it's on Spotify. Right. You know, but please listen to it. Yeah. And Mark, so, we'll pop that in the chat so people remember. But it, it's. Yeah, the, it's that entire album is. I just think it's fantastic. And I'm I'm also really happy with what I did on it too. Right. Good. Yeah. Well, there we go. We got one out of you. The Yeah. <laughs> which is good. Now, another one that we haven't talked about that's on that list is Altered State. <laughs> oh yeah. The Ghost Beside My Bed. Oh yeah. Do you know that record? No, I heard? didn't I had not heard it. No. Yeah, well, they were originally called the Acid Test, right? And then somebody else had that name and so then they had to change it to Altered State. And uh they're just a rock band from from Los Angeles, and they were really good. Another Tony Berg production, right? That I mixed at Bearsville, and uh, and this ghost beside my bed is this. I mean, it's about a ghost beside his bed. I mean, basically that's what it's about. And you know, am, am, am I dreaming? Am I going crazy? But I, I, what's happening? You know, and it's it's got crazy effects. I mean, just really a fun mix. I mean, just one of those things where. Okay, what wacky thing can I throw into this? Mix? Right, and the band would luckily they were into it, and it's just so much fun. And one of the most amazing guitar this guitar player. In fact, it's funny because at one point on other another song in the album, I pushed this piano track up, and it sounded like he had 
uh, midied it with a string synthesizer, right? I go, what do you get? Some kind of MIDI thing going? He goes, oh, no, no, no. That's just the piano with uh, my PCM 70. Uh, I go, what? You're kidding. I go, well, what, what did you, how did you have it set? And so he goes, well, I'll set, you got one here. I'll, I'll set it up. And, and, and he, he set up. So I've written down those, <laughs> those settings and they're still in my two PCM 70s right here that I'm looking at right now. Right. And uh, it's just like the coolest piano sound. And I've used it on almost every. Well, not every piano, but any kind of bet sort of ballad piano. But these guys were amazing. And not, not that many people. They got a little bit of play on KLOS and some rock stations out here. And Right. Um, but this, this one song, Ghost Beside My Bed, is really just a fun listen, I think. And that's all, So that's when, when's that record from? I thought it, it was on my list somewhere, oh, too. And I can't remember. That would have been late. Just, oh, it's 91, actually. Wow, ninety one that far back. Yeah, yeah it came out the same Bears- year as as play. Yeah, I mixed it at Bearsville. That's right. So it was before I had my studio here. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it was Tony Berg as well. So both right. those records. So were Tony. back to back to back. Yeah. yeah All right. So I'm gonna ask that- you one more uncomfortable question, just because I can. Um it's not that uncomfortable. I'm just curious because you you've had such an amazing career as a mixer but what what records would you put as sort of the landmarks not necessarily turning point because there isn't like oh it was all terrible and now it's all great I mean it's always a slow grind and I think people don't quite get how slow a grind it can be but there are records where you realize like oh hold on a second that that was a moment so what kind of landmark records are there in your career that you think back not even to listen to necessarily but you realize like that really kind of put me forward and moved things along well um the single mix of miss you for the stones right that would be one thing because all it was an introduction to the stones and or a professional introduction obviously i've been listening to the stones since i was a kid and so that was that was kind of a pretty big deal for me And then um, around the same time, um, Dance Away for Roxy Music, right, which introduced me to them, and um, that was a pretty big deal. Is that is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's I don't because like I don't even know how I would answer that question. Like, I mean, I can think of a couple things, but it's like there are. There are things that I don't even know. For me, it's not even about, oh, that made me turn the corner. It's more like, because I have such imposter syndrome, like it sort of validates the fact that I'm even here pretending I do this for a living sort of thing. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, that went well. Like that was a thing and that led to other things. And so I don't know, yeah. just if they're, you know. Yeah, that, well. I don't was, often ask cheap. vague questions on these things. So I'm I'm uncomfortable. I'm almost as uncomfortable asking as you are answering, just so okay. you know. Okay, no, no, it's cool. <laughs> uh, um, I think Sheik, you know, the, when getting introduced to those guys and and um, really that La Freak album was such a big deal. And, right. and that, that, was a, that was a pretty big deal. Of and of course that led to the Bowie like record that. too. And so. that led to the Bowie record and that was a big deal. Yeah, and then uh, there there was a few things that were like that. <laughs> that that was big. Then Springsteen, of course, the first time. Well, you know, just I mean, we went over wh- why how that started, but yeah, um, that was a that was a big turning point. You know, meeting up with him, and uh, I mean that that took a while. To, that was another thing that took a while before that really turned into something. I think because I, I just worked briefly to get them started but then he came back and we mixed uh born in the usa yeah just a little ditty on yeah yeah and uh you know brian adams of course that was that was um yeah huge huge thing for me yeah i don't know it's not the the greatest question in the world is it there was so many (laughs) things that that just went so right yeah (laughs) plus i was having a great time you know power station was fun I had lots of friends there. My friend Neil Dorsman and and Larry Alexander and all all the other engineers, Jason Corsaro, who was just like this almost rat pack of of mixers and engineers out of that studio, and we were all friends. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, it is an amazing group, and there were there were a couple of groups in New York 
that spawned around the same time and it's just incredible how many people there were yeah at that time it's really amazing um all right i'm gonna ask you one more dumb question and then we'll let mark come in with the uh the the q a portion of things which is so you've worked with almost everybody is there anybody that's still making records now that you really want to work with that you haven't yet is there anyone you hear that like oh i definitely want to do that i would imagine maybe alabama shakes yeah yeah i'd love to do do something for them that'd be that'd be great they're really good um i mean you too i never you're, really got to do any, i mean you're I one of the few bit. people i've interviewed who hasn't worked for you too which is yeah, crazy right. <laughs> yeah i know i mixed one thing for you too but it was it turned out to be it was the wrong thing or something like that i don't know um <laughs> but uh i mean i know bono a little bit you know i've run into him once in a while but uh so that that would i've always loved them and um uh, let me see so, and uh i don't know you know i'd love to do something way out of my wheelhouse like like taylor swift you know right that that might be interesting i think i could i could make a great record with her i mean just which that thing that she did on on the grammys recently was pretty cool i mean that was the only i thought one of the few good things on that show right yeah i haven't i haven't she, watched she that was, i should she probably was pretty, it was tough to watch the whole show was rough to watch but she was very good and um um there's a few there's this girl i think i mentioned her margaret glasby did i mention yeah, her yeah you mentioned yeah, her last time i'd like yeah. to do something she was really good but i don't know what happened to her she, she did one album and i haven't heard anything i, I should probably do some res research you do all this great research. I should be like you. And well, I, I don't I, look at anything. I just sit here and mix stuff. Of course, so my I'm last few questions make me feel like I haven't done any research at all. But I just like, I, it just feels so ridiculous to just go, okay, and what was it like to work with, you know, I feel like um, Chris Farley, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How was it working with Paul McCartney? Cool. All right. Great. How was it working with it? Because like, I mean, there's the Phil Collins record, the Plays Well With Others record. We didn't even mention that one. What? Which you've got a mixing credit on that supposedly according to the internet, but maybe not. Um, what what the Phil Collins Phil record? Collins? Yeah, for the recent one, the plays well with others that he did. No. A bunch. Of, all right, see, that's why I didn't want to do it because I thought, ah, oh, what if yeah. it wasn't? All right, what about Metronomy? That yeah, I did. Okay, so that you I, did, but that's the thing. Like we get where my research just is like, well, is your research correct or not? Well, okay, that one is incorrect. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, I know it's weird that, that how does that stuff happen? I wonder. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, at this for point some... for you, it probably you're the autofill for mixing. You know, maybe, but it <laughs> freaks me out because, like, to me, the the worst the worst thing is getting credit for something I didn't do. You know, I just well, that, I hate the thought of that. But know? I think that the thing is, and this is the problem with it, is that nobody trusts the credits on the internet anyway. So. <laughs> You know, the only way you can check it is to try and find a physical product and see if it's printed mm -hmm. on there. But I, I thought, I thought any everything on the internet was real, was right. It's you know, well, I mean, as Abraham Lincoln said, if it's on the fact. internet, it's true. Yeah, and didn't he say that? I'm sure yeah. he did. I read that on the internet. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorite little internet memes. <laughs> that's good so uh mark you want to come on in here i'm sure there there are a million questions that are better than mine but also i want to make sure that um both of uh bob's playlists get put up in the chat you know so yes. people can check them out because i know we posted them last time but both lists are are great really really Absolutely. good yeah those those are in the chat there guys um yeah cool this has been really really great i'm I'm really happy that you were able to do a part two and make that happen. So, and this gets yeah, us thanks. up over the five hours aggregate, which is like, that's the baseline for these interviews. <laughs> yeah. So, <okay>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You survived. Okay. Um, so our, uh, real quick for anybody who hasn't seen before, the way we run our Q and a portion is, uh, we have a, um, a stream going on crowdcast and crowdcast has an ask a question section where you can put your question in. 
and then everybody else can uh, choose to upvote your question. So we always start with the most upvoted questions. And our first one comes from Louis, and he says, hello from Watford, England, uh, two of my favorite mixers. Mr. Clear Mountain, can you recall your thought process behind your mix of The Cures Just Like Heaven? The single is quite different from the album mix, and I'm wondering if your decision to move away from the gated snare was driven by Born in the USA. Thank you both. <laughs> Which we talked about a little bit last time. Uh, away uh, from the gated snare. I never heard the album mix, so uh, I should have because I was a fan out there, so I should have heard it. But um, well, the album yeah, mix may not even have been done when you did the single mix, right? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know there was a different album mix, actually. Um, so wait, the, the, well, what was the question about the gated snare again? Was your decision uh, to move away from it? Based on, I guess, it? based on Born in the USA. I, 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 don't I don't even know. understand the question, to be honest. But uh, I don't know. I just, uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't think it needed a gated snare. Did I? I don't think I did it. No, I think snare I think that. that was his point. Is that right yeah. around the same time you've right. done gated snares elsewhere and didn't do it on this one? But I mean, I think well, that, it's, it's like everything's different. You know, I don't. Yeah. To just go oh this is the thing now so i'm gonna put this on every record well that's you know i mean so that was the really funny song? thing with uh with with daniel lenoir telling robbie like oh man he's gonna put gated snare all over your record like yeah. no no he's <laughs> yeah, not no. that's not how it works <laughs> no that's not what i do right. yeah so don't is there anything need. anything you, you remember record, about what does it need anything in particular about that mix or um uh i'd really like the song and uh I don't remember anything specifically about it, unfortunately, except, you know, um, I think I did, I probably used, might have used a snare sample, maybe. I, I just don't remember. I right. don't remember what I did, but uh, you know, I just tried to, I just liked it. I mean, I, I was a fan of theirs. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite records is, uh, is what Close to You, or Close to Me, or is it Close to You? I think it's called Close to You. Right. One, one, uh, for one of their records and um, yeah I wish I could remember more but it certainly, it certainly had nothing to do with mixing Springsteen for right. sure yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of the, to piggyback off of that question uh, do you remember maybe about how long that mix took eh, no probably six yeah. hours maybe five or six hours probably yeah, I would think. Yeah, I, mean, I was just, just thinking guessing. because, right? Yeah, so many of the questions are always about um, uh, specifics to each individual mix, and it's it's a, also a thing where it's like you might have only lived with that song for you know six hours, maybe not even a full day in some cases, right. and then to recall these tiny details of a small period yeah. of time is really difficult. Yeah. That's that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't remember if, if it was. I'm sure it was analog back then, but it was probably 24 track. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'd imagine I mean, you probably remember more about the phone call saying, hey, you want to mix a Cure song than yeah, the actual right. mix. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll mix a, of course I'll mix a Cure song. Yeah. You've had a lot of really cool phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or emails in the last yeah. 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna a, piggyback off that like question. A, Sorry. Oh, um, go for it. Um, no. So, obviously, you've gotten to the point where, with even with the SSL, I would imagine recalls can happen very, very quickly in your mm -hmm. studio. Are you still mixing a song at a time and trying to get it finished, or are you succumbing to people's wanting to kind of go in circles where you end up kind of mixing the whole record and then doing recalls on the whole record at the end and things like that? Um, no, I try to finish each each song. I definitely try to try to finish each song. And then, um, and then if something needs to be changed, then I'll do a recall. You know, it's not not a problem at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of times, a lot of times, I really prefer to come back to the first few songs, right? Because you know, once I've gotten a feel for the whole album and what it should be then uh, maybe let's go back to the first couple, and, you know, get them in line with the rest of it. So that does, that happens, but that's, 
that's usually more me. But you know, I'm I'm usually hoping that people, oh, let's let's remix like this journey record I'm mixing now that the, the single's already done, gone, and so I'm not going to be able to go back to it. Kind of wish I could, but I don't know. I th it sounded pretty good. I think. I'm sure it Happy sounds all it. right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I, don't, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. So let's go to our next question. This is from The Rog. Uh, he says or asks If your SSL would break down for good, what would you buy today? A DAW controller or another desk? I think I'd retire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That'd be it. I'm really sorry. Okay. Oh, hold on. No, yeah. Go I ahead. can show everybody Mole. Mole just came That's in. Right. Wait, Mole might go on my shoulders, which he likes to do. Hello? <laughs> I'm going to mute Bob says conversation. Oh, no, he doesn't. Here. He doesn't want to be up Mole. there. Come on, Mole. Did you already show your tape measure? I did. I showed the tape measure and the pencil and the Allen key. Okay. Um, yeah. But I, I have um, Mole here. I've got it. This uh, it's like a multi Allen wrench thing. So oh, but see, your your focus your focus got pulled. You're uh -huh. gonna have to. Oh, there you go. Yeah, is it still? It's good. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> is that metric? Thanks. Metric or, or imperial? I don't know what that means. Well, is it in millimeters or is it like? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> they're actually not labeled. They're not labeled. They're not labeled. That's the worst tool ever. No, no. So we're having a yeah. we're having a show and tell. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah uh sorry bob i muted you so your conversation wouldn't go through here you go i'll save the box okay. better for another okay thing. okay all right great next question uh so you would retire if the ssl broke down <laughs> um well probably not uh i don't know i, I guess i'd learn how to mix in the box i don't, I don't know i don't know what i do but we're finding hey. another ssl yeah <laughs> i'll probably try to fix it whatever you know what it would probably be the computer i guess and i have to find find another one a couple oh uh, uh um, a couple people has, had said that they have that you can get used computers <laughs> i so, just wish somebody would figure out a, a way to port it over to a mac or a pc or something you know and, and have it do work the same way but right on a more updated platform. I mean, why didn't why can't somebody do that? I guess so few people use it that it's just not worth it to anybody to do it. I, I would pay. If there's somebody out there that knows how to do that. I'll pay you personally. Okay. You know, you know who <laughs> probably would know how to do it is George Massenberg. Yeah, but he wouldn't do it. <laughs> no, but he might know somebody who would. Oh, maybe we would. I'll ask him. You know, because I know he certainly knows, because he wrote like custom software to convert SSL mixes to flying faders mixes. Oh, he did. So he, he knows did. the automation structure. Uh -huh. So he pro and this was a like for a Bruce Houdin thing because he wanted to be able to move back and forth between the two consoles at record one, no which was insane. And George just came over and like ate some cake and wrote a root. A thing Jeez. now that may not mean he knows anything about the structure of the computer itself but considering he yeah. made his own automation system as well right anyway wow i'd say call george that's yeah. what i'd say but let me ask you a question so obviously you're very 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 used to the ssl and yeah. you love that eq but would you say that it's as much sonics as it is logistics at this point because i'm sure you're doing more and more processing in the box because stuff comes to you processed and it's some of that stuff is easier so which part of it would you miss more do you think i think i think it's the automation i would miss more right you know yeah because i mean there's there's a yeah i could probably eq in 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 the box pretty much and do compression and things like that. And then from my, the outboard gear that I have. And um, so it's really the mix automation is, is such a pleasure to use. And, and it's so musical and just the way it works and uh, sort of effort effortless. And that that's the thing I would, you know, it's funny because most people don't even use the auto, this automation. They certainly don't use it the way I use it. Right. And um 
you know, and I, I, th I don't know. It just seems like if people understood what that was, what an incredible tool it is, nobody really remembers, I guess. I don't know. Well, and also we were talking about it before we started. You do use it differently than most people. Like you hate moving faders. You're yeah, right. VCAs all the time. So the faders never move. And it's a, that's a yeah. really different way of working even for an SSL. Yeah, it's just that uh, once you understand what the advantages of that, it's like you, you never want a, a fader to move. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it yeah. seems to me, anyway. <laughs> I know you think differently, but no, uh, no, no, sure. not at all. Everybody I mean, I, I just, yeah, I've just never worked that way. Yeah. I yeah, trick, I, I trick Pro Tools into working that way. And even with, with flying faders, you know, going into trim mode and things like that and having stuff sit there so I could grab and auto coalescing mm. trim automation. Like there's things mm. you can do that are sort of like that, but yeah. they're workarounds and not the way I would do it most of the time, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I would just wish somebody would do that. And then there's, you know, there's a couple of things that have always, to me, have always been wrong with the software. It's always been like a, I call them bugs and they call, call them features. Right. Of course, that kind of thing that I would change. So like if somebody would update it, I'd say, okay, now change this thing. It has always driven me nuts. <laughs> right. But, um, but that it would, it, it, I don't know, it'd be so great. I talked to that Tangerine guy, you know, that mm. company Tangerine? No. Well, they do a, a system where you can, it's basically you're running Pro Tools automation from the SSL. Right. Right. And so you feel, it feels like the SSL and you're using the little keyboard thing, but it's actually doing in, um, pro it's running the pro tools automation huh. and it's, you know, it's kind of a kludge and uh, a bunch of studios have, have gone to that, that have SSLs that, and, and the thing is, what's nice about it is that somebody can have an automate, all this automation in a pro tools session. And then it, it, it runs your 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 SSL. You know what I mean, right? You can you can update it on the SSL, but um, it's not really the same automation. doesn't doesn't do doesn't playlist um, mix passes, right? Which is one of the things that I hate about any other any automation besides this is that, that you can actually keep as many mix passes as you want, and you can edit between them, right? And well, no, Fine Fingers no does autom that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, flying yeah. faders, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it probably does do that. Yeah. But um although I don't know, I can't I can't figure out how to work flying faders. But, <laughs> but next um, time I come to LA, we'll we'll spend some time. <laughs> but Pro Tools that definitely doesn't do no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> I've got some really weird kludgy hacks to make it somewhat yeah. easier, but no, that that's not a concept in Pro Tools. Yeah. Right. Hmm. And it's just something I'm, I've always been used to doing, you know, yeah. in the old days. <laughs> anyway, good. So go, let's move on. What yeah. else? What yeah. else you got? Yeah. Uh, okay. So the next one is from Santiago. And he says, I've noticed that you ditched the NS10s a few years ago. Uh, why the change? And what do you think of the massive amount of options there are for near field monitors compared to when you first picked the NS10s, which weren't even marketed for audio professionals at first? So NS10 question. Um, well, I kind of got tired of them, I guess. I mean, I could still mix on them, I, I think. But then what happened is I, I found these speakers, these little Yamaha that you can't get anymore, these YSP7s, and, and I just liked them better. They were very similar, the same, basically the same size. And, but they just sound a little nicer, but they kind of did the same thing for me. And um, so that was it. I don't really have any opinion about how many different kinds of monitors there are. You know, it was a little bit, it was interesting that, that Chris Lordalgy went out and made, built it, or had somebody build his own um, NS10. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was sort of fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And you know, if I, if I was going to make a new speaker, I wouldn't, wouldn't make the same one. I would come up with something that's better. It's the sound yeah. of hits. <laughs> yeah. I, so. I got to say, it was 1985 or 86 or something like that when Mix Magazine actually did frequency responses of different brands of toilet paper. 
because oh, yeah. of the toilet paper over the tweeter <laughs> thing. And it was tongue in cheek, but a lot of people didn't get that it was tongue in cheek. I, I think the guy that did it was serious. Really? Yeah. God, I'm I always sure. just assumed it was a joke. No, that was uh, that wasn't a joke. He did he did real, real you know, anechoic chambers, and you know he analyzed it seriously. I wrote a letter back. That was tongue in cheek. <laughs> letter that I my the, my response was definitely tongue in cheek. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, if people don't but know, don't that think... was the the eighties practice of putting toilet paper over the tweeter to calm the thing them down was, a little it bit. Wasn't even toilet. I never used toilet paper. Nobody used toilet paper. Where were you Kim using? Wipes. Remember Kim Wipes? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. And they didn't. They the guy didn't even test Kim Wipes. Oh the right. The guy didn't even. You know, he should have called me up and said, "Oh, well, what what did you actually use?" We could have talked about it. Yeah. But you know, so never heard a word. About what it. led to that? Like what what made you decide to put a Kim Wipe on there? Well, they were too bright. They right. Were just too. They were just too bright. And what happens, I did a mix on them and um, took, took it home and my mix was dull. So, well, that's no good. My mix uh, uh, it needs more, uh, my mix needs more top end. So obviously I'm hearing too much, too many highs out of the tweeter. Right. So I asked the guys at Power Station, I said, could you stick something in that tweeter to tone it down a little bit and, or adjust the crossover somehow? And they said, no, no, we're not, we're not we don't do speakers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so well, what can I do? You know, because because my speakers were I was using these KLH 17s from when I was when I was a kid, and they were just falling apart. You know, the speakers were all the glue was drying right. out, you know what I mean? And uh, so I had a, I needed something and I didn't like big speakers. And so I said, well, maybe I could throw something over the tweeter, maybe that'll tone it down a little bit so well we got these kim wipes and i used that and i did a mix took it home yeah there you go that sounds, <laughs> that sounds right it works love it there you go pretty, pretty simple very scientific yeah yeah <laughs> you know, did all kind of analyzation of the kim wipe well i gotta say kim wipes <laughs> makes a lot more sense than toilet paper yeah yeah i never tried toilet paper no no all right moving on <laughs> <laughs> all right there it is Okay, uh, so our next question comes from Christian, and he says, thank you both for being here. Question for Bob, how do you get over imposter syndrome? What could be, or sorry, how could we be more confident in our skills without coming across as arrogant? <laughs> well, Bob, do you have what? imposter syndrome? I don't think you do. Yeah. What is what is that? What does it mean? It means that know. you you're always worried you're going to get found out, that you're not oh. good enough to oh, do no, it. No, I'm not over that. Okay, well that's always, imposter syndrome. I'm always worried about that. Yeah, I'm always. I always figured somebody's going to finally realize. Oh, it's just that name that he came up with, Clear Mountain. That's the only reason he's famous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you do indeed have it. So how do you how do you deal with it? Uh. Well, I just, I don't know. I ignore it, you know? Yeah. I go, whatever. You just, I mean, I kind of do have a bit of that. I just think somebody's going to find out that I'm actually not that good at this. You know, there's other people way better. And, but I'm still making a living at it and people are still hiring me. So fuck it. I'm not saying anything. Yeah. About it. Well, I got to say <laughs> you hide it incredibly well. I mean, I practically have a t-shirt on that says I have imposter syndrome. I mean, I talk about it all the time and yeah. it's almost like if I mention it first, then no one else will mention it. So it's like, get it, let's get this out of the way. So I would say that your strategy for dealing with it is to ignore it. And it's probably the best thing you can ignore. do. You just swallow it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Plus, yeah, you know, that came up. Andrew asked that um, kind of often on, on the show, too. Like, just talking Yeah, and it never occurred to it. me that you had yeah, it so. because you didn't, you don't come across as someone who's actually suffering from it. So, well done, sir. I don't, I don't think I suffer from it. You know, I don't suffer from anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> Other than a stiff neck once in a while when I sleep on it. But, um, no, I, you know, there's always that thing that, that I don't know in the back of my mind somebody's going to realize wow oh, he's he's not really that good you know <laughs> well 
Yeah. And because I don't think I'm that good. I really, I really don't. I mean, I've, I, there's a few mixes I've done, which I really, which we've talked about that. I think, yeah, yeah I nailed that. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, but just generally, I, I just think, man, I'm, is this, does that sound good? Is that, is that better than somebody else would do? You know, I think that all the time and uh, you just have to ignore it. You just have to go whatever, just move on. Right. <laughs> And look, just be glad that I'm working. You know, I'm I'm an old guy now, and I'm still work. I'm still doing this. People and still, are still hiring me. Still really, really good. But uh, I think Thank it's you. it's great advice. It is because it's it's hard to do that, but you can get stuck in it if you don't just put it away. Yeah, probably can. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. Here's next the... question, because that's, that's okay. Very intense that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, our next one is uh, from Louis again. And he asks, uh, do you have any tips on recreating the power station stairwell reverb in the box? And how do you approach? Uh, well, let's just start there. Let's start there. And then we'll do part two of the question. That's a tough one, you know, because when we did the, the surround mixes for Avalon, <clears throat> I was really faced with that because that whole album is the power station stairway. And um, I just, well, at the time, I actually didn't have the, the reverbs. I mean, now there's so many great, like, Altiverb impulse responses. And, you know, there's a lot of other things like that. There's um, Bracosti and all these other things that are pretty incredible. And um, what's that? There's, there's a Valhalla. That's a pretty cool sounding reverb. And... Um, but I just I just tried combinations of different reverbs is what, what I did because that that particular chamber had this decay that where the, the top end would slowly decay faster than the, the mid-range in the bottom. And so it just it was just this and just the way it did it was amazing. I mean, most reverbs kind of do that, I suppose, but but you know, different parts of the the frequency response had different decay time just the way the the chamber work the chamber was and so i would try to mimic that where i'd have different you know a bunch of different reverbs and you know i have one a short one doing the 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 treble part and a another one doing the sort of mid-range and something else doing the the bottom end you know that sort of like that just combinations of different reverbs is really the the only way i could figure out to do it you know, and nowadays, I mean, geez, Altiverb alone has so many great um, theaters and churches and all kinds of sound stages. You know, it's amazing what what's already there done for you. <laughs> you know, right? But nothing's ever going to be that stairwell. Well, that's the thing. I haven't found anything that's that sounds quite like that. You know. And it's sad because it doesn't really exist anymore, you know. Right. You can't get back in there and do a sweep. You can't. No, it's just they kind of the the uh, the city came in and said, "Oh no, you can't have that. You got to change it." Stupid fire safety. Yeah. Saving right, exactly. lives and ruining reverbs. Yeah. <laughs> they should have put it <laughs> added a, a fire escape on the outside of the building. That's what I would have done. I would have said, "Okay, just put a, another fire escape outside." Right. So the people can get off the roof. Don't fuck with the live chamber, man. You know, mm -hmm. big right. mistake. Let's tell you the story yeah. about what it was, it was actually Journey that I was mixing when I discovered what had happened. Because I was, I had been working at other studios quite a bit. And then Journey asked me to mix this record called Raised on Radio. And we did it at Bearsville. And there were two big power ballads. They said, look, we should go down and get the live chamber at Power Station, do these down there. So, you know, I put the thing up and I, I said, okay, let's hear chamber one. And the guy, the assistant set it up. And I said, no, no, chamber one, that's not chamber one. Because it just sounded terrible. And uh, no, no, it is. Well, check your patches. Check the patches. No, that's right. I checked the patches. It is. It's right. It's because they had a little thing on the wall that said what chambers you had in this little display. And... Uh, so I went, oh, well, let me see what's going on. And I walked into it and and I saw what they had done. They had extended the, the concrete and steel stairs to the roof. 
and they put another it which just didn't it just it sounded terrible you know and uh you know, I went in and yelled at the owner, Bob Walter, said, what the fuck did you do? How did, no, no, they didn't really change it. They just put a little ladder in there, right? He had no idea what they did. Wow. He never even looked at it, you know? I said, I said, why did you let them do that? You know, I was so angry. And so <laughs> I took the, I think, I, I don't know what I did, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember what I did. I think I, I just got out of there. I was so angry. Right. Know? Wow. And it wasn't this. Is this something that they fault. could undo? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, they probably could, yeah. you know, but I don't think they're going to do that now. No. You know, now that, yeah. And it's probably kind of the beginning of the end of different studios offering different things for mixing. Because, yeah. I mean, obviously, the recording rooms, it's still different in every studio. But at this point, mm -hmm. what would be different? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I know. And something yeah. like that. It's a, you know, I mean, there's so many things in the box. So there's some pretty, pretty great reverbs. Yeah. Now, geez, yeah. the phone keeps ringing. I'm so sorry. That's all Let's right. Just take, take a second. Get, on, get rid of this. Yeah. No worries. Hello? Um, what do I have to show you? I can show you the small dish that I had a little piece of chocolate out of earlier. A little piece of dark chocolate. Nice. It's nice. It's it's good. Good. Rather can actually, let me show you something here, man. Of... They got they got yeah. some sample mugs made up with the logo of the show, which is really cool. And it's a really good mug. But look at look how washed out it is. I've only been using it for like six weeks, two months. No, more than that. Now, a couple uh, of months. We use top quality stuff when we make those But things. I'm just saying, <laughs> like, it's been through the dishwasher a lot. <laughs> Anyway, you can unmute Bob. And okay. Oh, go. I'm back. I was just sorry. Go. That's right. I was just talking about a coffee mug, so <laughs> you didn't miss anything. <laughs> awesome. All okay, right. You well, got time for a couple more? To, uh, part two of the question um, from that one. So uh, his other part of it was about Avalon. Um, so he was saying, you know, any tips on recreating that stairwell reverb in the box, and how did you approach the panning of the reverb on Avalon? Each individual element seems to have its own localized reverb tail that spreads to the opposite side of the stereo image. It isn't all just one big mush, which is incredible given how wet the record is. Most of that are delays, really. You know, and then sometimes I might have, I don't remember, I might have used a couple of plates or something and put them on different sides and set things across. But I, I think most of it are, are, you know, I did a lot of delays that crossed over you know that would i'd send something from the left over to the right thing, things like that but um that's that's about it i mean but that that's a really important point and i think it's something that it doesn't get taught really it's the psychoacoustics of mixing because by having the sound have a drier delay it drags the reverb with it so it makes you think that the reverb is moving even though it isn't that's true yeah that's a good point yeah, because I'll put put reverb on the delay. Yeah, you know? but that reverb so is a, isn't going to be localized to only be there. It's still going to spread no, out. No, it's going to be stereo. Yeah. Well, that's the thing with the with my plugins that, that you can put reverb on the on the output of the delays, and so that that does that. So and then you can cross them, but then the reverb is really stereo. Right. But then you can also pan the reverb. You can put the separate the reverbs too if you want to, but. You know, basically, it's stereo. Yeah. I mean, for, for people working in the box, one thing that I do a lot, which works really, really well, is to use multi-mono reverbs. Because then mm -hmm. as you pan, it's very, very discreet as to where the oh, reverb yeah. is showing up because it doesn't wash back over to the other side. So you don't get a really nice stereo reverb, but you get a pinpoint placement. And if you right. do something like a delay into an auto panner, it leaves these trails of reverb everywhere that there was a delay. And Ooh, it's super discreet and cool. And that's really difficult to do in hardware unless it's like a digital reverb that you can have two of. Let me just write that down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a good one. It's I great. Yeah, multi-mono and then just have the pan on the send follow your main pan. Or mm -hmm. not, if you want to make it, you know, do something else. But yeah, it's also a great way to add, if you want to just set up, like, spring, you got a bunch of different guitars, and they all need a little bit of room, and you want to have them all panned opposite the guitars. If mm -hmm. you do it with multi-mono, you can just place each one's spring, but you only use two reverbs. Yeah, right. 
Cool. Thank you for that. Well, <laughs> I will use that. <laughs> excellent. Well, the you know the awesome. the mix this chambers, which is in in the uh, spaces and the domain, it's actually a true stereo reverb because there's two rooms, there's two chambers. Right. And and it's Sarah. I use it off of a stereo aux, and so I can send something from the left into the right chamber. Right or vice versa. Yeah, well, that that's exactly yeah, yeah multi mono yeah. reverbs. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. They're two monos. Exactly what it is. You know. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, so next question is from Dusty Wakeman, and Dusty asks, <laughs> "Hey, do Dusty. you find yourself using less compression for five one or Atmos?" Uh, it's about the same, really. Um, Atmos, you know, I've upgraded my compressor. So you got that done? Is, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool actually. <laughs> that it's it's actually a sixteen channel compressor, analog analog compressor wow. now, which uh, wow. with some help from Lucas at Apogee and Brandon Duncan, my former assistant. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, because it's 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 really the the SSL bus compressor. And then when we went to 5.1, because there's extra VCAs in the console, which are the same VCAs that are used in the compressor, um, I've just linked those to the output of the, the uh, to the DC that comes out of the um, the bus compressor. And now we've, what I did is I bought another, I found a Euro rack on a website on Reverb, and uh, which has got those cards in it, right? The, all those extra VCA cards. So that's sitting under under the console down there. And that's all linked together. And then I, well, there's three controls so that I can do less compression on the sides or less compression on the rear or the overheads. All right, so wow. I can control how much compression, which is really gonna be handy when I start mixing live stuff. Because yeah. Because you don't want, you really don't want to compress the audience as much as you're hitting in the front. I like to hit, hit it pretty hard in the front. But is the detector still just off the quad bus? Yeah, so so the detect, so you have to have a stereo mix. The detector's just looking at the stereo At the mix. stereo, right. So you have to have a stereo mix going at the same time. Right, so you'd, so I always do. you'd run a fold down, basically, right. I'm thinking about like for people trying to set up something like that who aren't on a console, it would be that you would have to fold down your surround to a stereo to get things to go. And then you could yeah. back off how much compression was happening in other places, right? If you don't have a separate stereo mix, yeah, that's what you'd, you'd have to do. You right. Know? For for me, I always, the stereo mix is, come, is totally separate. It's coming off, off the, the pan pots. Right. Whereas the, the, the surround is coming off the bus selectors, you know, through the small fader. Right. And, um, but uh, yeah, and it's fantastic. I mean, it really, because you get the same, that same feel of that compression in Atmos. That's awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't yeah. lose any of that. That's really cool. Cause I've been wondering how I'm gonna do like my 714, you know, cause mix bus wise, I, there's not a lot of how dynamics processing, it? but there's some, and that's how, is I'll do a little crash down to stereo as a detector and put it into the side chains because otherwise right. it's all going to be multi-mono and it's going to destroy things. So, Yeah, things will move around too much. Yeah, it screws your balance up. But yeah, that's how you'd have to do it. Right. You know? And um, uh, what else was we going to say about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's probably, that makes sense. Yeah, you had to put it in the, in the, in the side chains. Right. Awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, it had to do, it was a bit of circuitry involved. I mean, it was quite a bit. Of, they actually did the whole PC board and it's, you know, pretty custom. <laughs> but it's, I, I think it's, I'm the only one, as far right. as I know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really happy about it. And the thing is, it works so well. Oh, I know what I was going to say, because it also does the master fader, because that's part of that circuit. Oh, right. Yeah, so it's just the same VCA. So I can do a, if I have to do a fade or, you know, I always do this thing where I, I keep the fade, the fader down until the music starts, so to clean up the front, so they don't have to do it in mastering, and it does all that, you know. That's really handy. Yeah, 
That's brilliant. Well, and it, we were talking before we started about, you know, VCAs and how incredibly cool they are. And I think people don't realize that you can, they're voltage controlled amplifiers. I mean, it's what it stands for. Right. But you can combine all kinds of control voltages before you finally send it to the one VCA. So people assume VCA based stuff where you actually have more amplifiers in the circuit. But if you do it properly, mm. you can have many fewer. Yeah, that's that's really good. And that and that's doing, you know, because it's dealing with the compression, right? First of all, the, the, the detector that's doing the compression, it's dealing with the feed from the computer as well, because it's doing the master fader. Yeah. And um and it's also dealing with the yeah, then the, the master fader control as well. You know, all, all those things are combined. And that was the thing that Lucas really had to figure out to, to make that that actually work properly. Right. Yeah, keeping all those ratios right. Yeah. Nice. Pretty genius. And then then also I have a rotary master fader, which which years ago I, I discovered I was I was trying to do a fade, trying to I I was simulating a fade for somebody. Year, this is years ago in the '80s, and and I was doing it on the the monitor control. And oh, there you go, just like that. Okay, great. Now and then I tried to do it with a, the fader, and it took me like eight tries to get it as smooth as I as I could do it with a knob. I went, well, wait a minute. How, why don't I put the master fader on a knob? And so. Um, the guys at uh, A&M, they made me a box that did that. And so he, when I got this console, I had it built in. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's instead and of the fader. Yeah. So yeah. I have a switch. I can use either if I want to, but I never use the fader. And it's just so easy. I can do a perfect fade every time. That's exactly so funny. Exactly perfect. You know, because <laughs> you get got to figure just these few muscles in your hand but on a master fader, right. it's all these muscles. It's it's your shoulder, yeah. it's your elbow, right? It's right because so of course, a lot like when you're when control. you're riding a vocal, you can plant everything except your finger. But when you're fading out, you got to lift your arm, and then all of a yeah. sudden, it's really difficult. Yeah, that's right. And, wow, and it's amazing how much easier it is to do a proper fade. Mm. You know, of course, Man. not that many records get faded nowadays, but yeah, once in a while, it happens. Yeah, it comes up. <laughs> I'm mixing something right now that has a fade in, which is oh yeah like, oh cool wow that's right. neat yeah that's always fun yeah a little party train action yeah so. great <laughs> nice awesome uh, do you have time for maybe two more sure all right two more okay all right so then I got to eat lunch from Adam. I've, I've haven't had lunch <laughs> yet <laughs> oh man remember. it's like two o'clock there yeah okay. Um, so Adam asks, how would you deal with, uh, from a psychological point of view, a client that can't let go of a song's completion? It's amazing. It's clearly finished, but they seem to be stuck and looking deeper than they should be for changes. Well, man, it happens all the time. Uh, so you just, you know, do whatever you can to please them. I mean, I don't really have, I wish I had a, a good answer for that a way to 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 get somebody to move on you know and you, you got to be careful what you say because you you know you, i had a guy a guy run out crying when i said look it's finished what's the problem you know what are you going to do and this guy just started crying it's, hey there's no crying in mixing <laughs> as tom hanks might say <laughs> but uh so you got to be you know you can't be rude and you got to Sometimes you just got to deal with it and, and just, okay, well, let's try something else. Let's try something else. So finally, and then you just give them maybe a few different choices. Say, look, let's try it five different ways. And then you can print them all and you know, just decide later. I don't know. <laughs> right. You know, but that's, that's, a, it happens. I mean, I'm fam very familiar with that problem and it's a drag. <laughs> Yeah, I always try and divide it into the two categories. One is somebody who's actually trying to realize an artistic thing. Yeah. And then every once in a while, and it doesn't happen that often, but every once in a while you get somebody who's just screwing around. And my oh. solution for them is to have somebody else who has my second authorization for all my plugins. And I say, hey, 
you want to work with my engineer 25 pounds an hour which is pretty cheap to be able to work on your mix <laughs> but as soon as there's money involved it's like no no actually i think we're good or let, okay we'll just do this <laughs> right. one more thing and you can tell pretty quickly and then there's some people who would go forever because they're really trying to get somewhere yeah. I don't think I've ever had somebody who really doesn't want to finish but isn't going for something. Yeah, right. Yeah, most people are going going for something, but a lot of times they just don't know what it is. Yeah. And they're just trying different things until it, it feels right, you know, and it's tough. What do you do? You know, you got to, I mean, sometimes that's what it takes to get a, a mix, get some, get the right thing. You know what I mean? Because I want the, the client to be happy. I, I don't want them to... Go, to leave and think, oh, I didn't quite get it. Right. You know? And so I'll, I'll usually stick it out and go, well, let's try it. I keep suggesting things and just let's try something else. And um, and then maybe give them some, some different choices. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, sometimes if it's, if it's an asshole, just kick them out. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, go away. I don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> the guy's a jerk. But most people aren't. No. You know, that's the thing. That's very rare that you get some guy that's just being an asshole you know in fact I, I i can't think of when the last time that's happened to me i think i've only really had it happen once and as soon as it was going to cost them money they were done so well, that's a good idea you just say yeah okay it's yeah. going to cost you another another two grand yeah <laughs> if we keep yeah. going if we go another day it's another two thousand dollars or something or a thousand dollars. Not whatever. even I mean, I was talking like you know, seventy five dollars, you know. <laughs> right. And that was no, no, no. All right, we're done. <laughs> all right. That's last question. Yeah. This is all this right. is gonna be the question of all questions. No pressure. Okay. It's actually just um, gonna be whatever the next question was, but <laughs> and it's from Tom Dial. Um hey, Tom. and his <laughs> Tom says, hello from Manhattan. What is a major mistake that you see mixers making when they're starting out? Deciding to be a mixer? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, sorry. No, that's not true. Um, when they're starting out. Um, well, geez, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't deal with other mixers very much so it's really hard to say i'm trying to think back when i started out um well thinking that i i was good you know but don't yeah don't think that that you're good that you got a ways to go before you get this and um don't in fact don't ever ever think that so don't ever think that you're better than anyone else is that that there's always something that you're going to learn there's always something new and not only that but um you can a great great suggestion can come from just about anybody you know the guy delivering the pizza might say something um that oh well that's a good idea let's do that you know what i mean just be open to to anything i mean some a lot of ideas are just stupid off the bat and you'll know that but some sometimes mm -hmm. well, wait a minute that might that might be something we could try you know just be totally, totally open to, to any sort of idea because that, that could make the, whatever the thing is that you're doing, that could put it over the top. And that's happened to me lots of times where people have said things that it comes from, you know, somebody's girlfriend walks in and says something. Oh, well, that's interesting. Let's try that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. probably the, the thing don't think that you know everything because you don't <laughs> mm -hmm. i think yeah. we can leave It'd it there if you did <laughs> yeah that's awesome that's a it's a great mm. a great way to think about it yeah i think so awesome well mr thank clear you, mountain Bob. this has been incredible thank you so much for all the time it's been really good and really good to hang out. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we will get to do this in person at some point, maybe even this calendar year. We yeah, see. I hope so. Yeah. And for everyone out there, if <clears throat> if I sound pretty good other than, than the frog in my throat, hype mic, Apogee hype mic. Hype mic. The best and I got to say, we got a better angle on it because you can actually see the meter getting reflected in your pop filter mm. oh great yeah good but it's got a good meter and I pl you plug the headphones in there it's got direct monitoring so if you're doing a zoom call 
or Skype, you can tune, you can hear your out your your own voice back through the through the direct monitoring, which is really great. Now, does it have you a built-in pop filter, or do you need an external one? That's my question for you. Uh, it's well, it's got a screen on it, okay. but it comes with this little pop filter. Thing. Oh, it comes with it. Yeah, it comes with a cool little swivel mount, you know, and uh, it's just. This thing is shit, man. It's, it's, I mean, the shit, I should say, not the <laughs> shit. <laughs> no, that's, that's what, what the kids really say. Is. And a lot of voiceover people. Oh, I see your cat down there. Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, squid down there. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, and Apogee. All Apogee, the way. hype mic. Apogee plugins. Try the, people don't know about Apogee plugins. The Poltec and the, the Mod Comp and, and, and the, um, they're just, they're so good and people have no idea. So why don't really? people know? It's I don't weird. know. You know, I don't, I don't really know. Cause you know, waves and all these other companies, they have big promotions and this and that. And Apogee's just this tiny little company. Like, like I said, we did a little video and I said, look, Apogee's like, it's like Reno, Nevada. You know, Reno, Nevada is the biggest little city in the world. Apogee's the biggest little company in the world. People think it's big because you see Apogee stuff right. everywhere. But man, it's you know, and the, they make they make these great. They're just a bunch of fan, total fanatics, and it's just so good. And I just have to throw that in. I'm sorry to plug plug my wife's company, but yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. And and yeah, I'll tell you, the stuff. they're running a special on plugins tonight. Buy two, get two plugins. Yeah, great. There you so, go. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. All right. Pay to pay twice. Post a link. Pay double mm -hmm. price. Get the second <laughs> one for the regular price. Uh, no, right. I, yeah. Anyway, yeah. all right. Oh, I'm gonna good. I'm gonna stop spouting gibberish. You're gonna go get some lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um. And back next week. This it's part two month for people who don't know that. So next week is part two with Eric Valentine, which should be oh, quite Ooh, I fun tune in for that. and geeky. Yeah, it'd be I'll good. We didn't talk that. about any of his gear yet. So we barely got past Smash Mouth in part one. So yeah, we got to we got to get to the consoles and remote mic movement he, stands. And, but he like built his own console or something. Yeah, right? exactly. The undertone yeah. consoles. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely going to talk about those. Right. Excellent. So it'll be good. But thank you so much again. And thank you. We'll talk to you soon. All so right. thanks, Andrew. Thanks, thank Mark. You. All right, I'm muting and thank going you. to the thanks screen.